Good evening. I'd like to call to order this Tuesday, April 17th, 2018 meeting of the uh, Princeton Board of Education. Welcome to this public meeting of the Princeton Board of Education. The board is an elected unpaid group of 10 citizens who set policy and make decisions on educational, financial, and personnel matters for the Princeton Public Schools on behalf of all residents. We're always pleased when members of the public attend our meetings. The board and the school operate under applicable New Jersey laws and under the regulations of the New Jersey State Board of Education. Each meeting contains an opportunity for those attending to comment on items in the published agenda or of other matters of interest to them, and the board reserves the, the right to limit the time allotted to public participation. I'll speak a little bit more about that in a minute. Law limits individual discussion of, indiv of personnel and confidential matters. We desire that our meetings provide useful opportunities for communication between the board and the community, so thank you for attending tonight. And with respect to public comment tonight, this is a fairly short meeting. We have a presentation from our architects and a presentation from our bond advisors. Um, and we'll also have one public comment session. It will be approximately 30 minutes long. And we passed out sign-up sheets, one which I have here, and I believe there's still one outside. Yeah, if you'd like to comment, we just request that you sign up ahead of time so we can manage uh, the time effectively and make sure that people who um, want to say something can, but within an allotted period of time that, uh, that keeps respectful of, of all of us. So with that, Ms. Kennedy, would you call the roll? Patrick Sullivan. Here. Betsy Kelber Baglio. Here. Beth Barron. Here. Debbie Bronfeld. Here. Jess Deutsch. Absent. Bill Hare. Here. Daphne Kendall. Here. Greg Stinkowitz. Here. Michelle Talk Ponder. Present. Evelyn Spahn. Here. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, Brian Liu. Uh, it's this way. Kind of missing something. Turn Amy Wang. Did you turn it on? Did you turn it on? Okay, I'm here. Hi. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So with that, I think we'll, the order that you see in the agenda tonight has public comment at the end. We're going to change that a little bit. Um, oh, you've changed it already. You're fast. Okay. So um, we're going to start with, with, right, we're going to start with our own, with uh, the superintendents and the president's remarks. So I'll just start by saying, really excited to be here tonight. This is a step in a process that's been at least two years in the making. We have been working on solving the issues around the overcrowding in our schools. And I think this process, I've been very proud personally and proud on behalf of the administration and the board of how open it's been along the way. There's been many opportunities for people to give input and that's not only parents but also taxpayers, that's the teachers who will work in these buildings and it's even the students who will learn in these buildings. So I think it's been a great open process and I'm really excited about that. I think also it's been an iterative process. So we've seen even from last week when we met here for four and a half hours, which I promise we won't do tonight, I hope. Um, but we heard comments. We've reacted to some extent to those comments, and some of those comments reflected what was the direction we were heading in anyway. Um, you'll see that the overall referendum amount tonight is lower than it, than it was. The tax impact to an average homeowner is much less than, than we uh, feared it might be. So we appreciate all the work that our um, business administrators and others have been doing to work on those numbers. But we're being responsive, I think, to feedback. And we appreciate feedback because this isn't a board project or an administration project. This is a project of this community to educate our children and to make a statement about our really reverence for public education. Um, so with that, I'm you know very encouraged to be here. Tonight, by the way, I know there's been some conversation about Cranberry and the send-receive relationship. We have a meeting next Tuesday, which is uh, our normal monthly board meeting. We'll be dedicating a significant amount of time at that meeting to going through the law, the facts, the finances of the send-receive relationship with Cranberry. And we expect to have at least a month after those discussions to discuss it amongst ourselves and amongst the community. So tonight, um, if you are here to discuss that, you're perfectly welcome to discuss whatever you like, but really the appropriate time to talk about Cranberry, the pros and cons, and um, the relationship as a whole is next Tuesday. Um, so just wanted to put that out there as well. 
So with that, I'll turn it over to Steve, and then um, I think process-wise, if we if we go to uh, Scott to and, Scott. and right. the Bond Council, because there's important information, I think, for anyone who's interested, as many of you obviously are, that they have to present, and then uh, take about 30 minutes for public comment. So again, if you haven't signed up on, on this clipboard, there's one outside, or maybe it's circulating now, um, but if we could get that before the public comment period, that would be great. So again, thank you for coming tonight. I'm very excited about what we're doing here. I think it's a great plan, um, and I appreciate all of the hard work of everyone in this town who's um, working on making it great. So, Steve, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Pat. I just I really want to echo um, Mr. Sullivan's uh, excitement and, and appreciation uh, for the people who've been involved in this process. I want to thank um, our board members, um, each and every one of them, our business administrator, our architects, um, those who are here tonight, those who are um, in Michigan, um, our staff, uh, our students, and, um, and all of our community members for, for their input uh, thus far into our referendum design. We've had a lot of very smart, very passionate people um, focused on the future of our kids, and I'm, that's always a good thing, and I'm grateful for that. Um, and I believe the design we have at this point in the process reflects um, the collective um, intelligence, vision, and care um, that one would expect in this community. The design process, is, as Pat mentioned, has really been one of, of openness, uh, one in which we have invited and considered multiple and sometimes competing perspectives, and that too is a good thing. That has moved us forward. Um, our goal after our last meeting was to sharpen our pencils. Uh, it was to consider ways in which we could reduce the cost of the referendum uh, without compromising our stated need for increased capacity and without compromising the educational and security goals that I know we all have for our kids. I believe that we, um, we've done that. Uh, the project we will present tonight has been reduced by close to $6 million. It has been financed in a way that significantly lessens the tax impact in those first few years. Um, and I do believe that the goal that all of us um, here tonight, those of us watching at home, those of us um, in this community have, is for a project that, that meets our needs, um, a project that we can afford, and a project of which we and our children can be proud um, now and well into the future. Um, so without further ado, I'd really like to just introduce um, Scott Downey, who's our lead architect on this project, he's going to bring us up to speed on the current scope and cost of the referendum. And I'd like to also uh, welcome Brian Morris from Phoenix Advisors, um, who will jump in when needed. Um, so gentlemen, you're on. Uh, good evening, everybody. So I'm going to take you through a presentation. Uh, I recognize some people. Some of you have been here for the prior presentation, so you'll forgive that there will be some redundancy there. However, there are also a lot of new faces, so we want to make sure that we uh, cover the basis in that regard. So uh, why are we talking about referendum? As you heard, the district has is facing a number of challenges, not the least of which is growing enrollments. Uh, two buildings specifically, the middle school and the high school, are already appreciably over capacity that the district has been managing that situation over years, and that has meant increased class sizes and other impacts. So um, other upgrades are also needed to the facility, safety and security considerations. There are physical plan upgrades to keep the buildings operating as intended. Um, you guys have many wonderful buildings and many wonderful spaces, but also in some of your buildings, those spaces haven't changed for many, many decades while the learning and the teaching that is happening in them has evolved substantially over that time. So we're looking at ways to move those spaces, keep what works, move those spaces towards more contemporary learning spaces that will uh, reflect the types of academic activities and learning that is going on in them or trying to go on in them right now, and also field and athletic related needs uh, at the various campuses. So uh, enrollments, we'll touch on real quick. Uh, the district continues to grow. Uh, you'll see here the, the uh, blue are the historic numbers. These are actually already booked. The red is the next five years. Um, so you see the growth over that time span, and then that growth is projected to continue in the five to 10-year window. 
The yellow line you see running up uh, higher, um, several projections were done, each of which considered different levels of possible housing development in uh, the township. Uh, recent court rulings have resulted in a potential housing development that we anticipate that falls in between the projection you see here and that line there. So we feel uh, that can be absorbed in the numbers that we're working with or looking at. So specifically, a solution is uh, before you that I'll go into in some detail, and that includes a couple of things. First, it includes upgrades to the existing elementary and the middle schools. It includes the creation of a new 5-6 school. The superintendent has talked about many of the educational benefits of that particular configuration. Uh, speaking as an architect, the facility benefits or the capacity benefits of a 5-6 school are that we relieve capacity by pulling the fifth grade out of the elementary schools and allow the enrollment growth to be absorbed fairly effectively. We also deal with the capacity issue at the middle school by pulling the sixth grade out. Combining those two together in a single facility creates a facility that every student in the district would experience, would flow through, and would be a part of, and allows the district to maintain the current neighborhood elementary school sending relationships that are in place now. Uh, the high school, a series of renovations and expansion to um, add capacity and also uh, update, make more contemporary the learning environment at that school. We'll go into some detail on that. Athletic improvements, fields and so forth at various campuses and schools. And in order for the 5-6 school to be constructed on this site here at Valley Road, the district administration needs to be relocated. So there are two um, specific solutions for that. Uh, maintenance and transportation offices and bus parking and so forth will be relocated to a new property to be purchased on Herontown Road, and I'll show you how that site would lay out. And then in addition to the John Witherspoon Middle School is proposed for the main administrative function, superintendent, business administration, and academic support and so forth. And we'll show you how that would shape up as well. So in terms of the upgrades at the elementary schools, they, uh, you see them listed on the screen. They encompass safety, security, mechanical and HVAC upgrades, accessibility improvements, uh, door hardware and doors, which relate to accessibility as well as security, the ability to configure those buildings, um, update the electrical configuration at those buildings so that generators could be added in the future or could be hooked up on a temporary basis as need might require, and also electrical service upgrades to allow for HVAC improvements and other things. Uh, at Littlebrook, library upgrades. Library uh, at Littlebrook was not upgraded or not uh, updated, I should say, when the other libraries were recently. And um, at several schools, adding doors within the building. So as you enter as a visitor, we can, we can control the areas of the building that you have access to, both during the day and after hours for special events. So that enhances security and control in those buildings. At the middle school, HVAC work, um, specifically in the pod areas, classrooms, cafeteria, adding air conditioning in some areas, electrical upgrades, uh, a connector between two of the wings. Currently, the kids uh, transition between those two areas, the CNE e wings outside. And uh, renovation of the old library space. This is the space that was uh, when the a median Commons was created. This was the space that was vacated for that purpose. So renovating that for a dual use, both educational during the day, and also because the district administration would be located that there to serve as a board meeting type space, training space for evening and other activities. Also uh, parking being at a premium at the middle school and high school campus area. Uh, adding additional parking along Franklin Avenue is also part of the scenario here. At the high school, in addition to the uh, space improvements that we'll talk about, uh, there are HVAC and air conditioning improvements at the school, electrical upgrade, some roofing repair, and um, mitigation of water issues at the auditorium wing. We're going to do some things to try and contain and prevent future flooding that has occurred in the past there. And also upgrades to the building entry and security at that building as well. So. Going uh, piece by piece here to talk about the various features. The 5-6 school proposed for this site. Um, you see the new proposed building here. Uh, this is Witherspoon. This is Valley Road at the top. So uh, adjacent, you have obviously the fire station. There's a future um, emergency facility programmed or, or planned for this part of the uh, area here, this part of the intersection. Town Hall, obviously, here. So um, traffic and flow considerations around the site were preeminent concerns. We worked very closely with the township. We met with the police and emergency officials to kind of plan out and talk about the plan that you see here. And specifically, this plan works. Oop, I apologize. 
this plan works by um, traffic and drop-off would happen in this area. Specifically, we've moved the entrance down Valley Road, so, so drop-off traffic would flow in, would loop around, and flow out. So creating as long a flow pattern away from the corner as possible to try and move the cars and the traffic off of the Witherspoon and Valley Road corner to increase safety access and so forth. The main entrance to the building proposed to be right here. Now also for safety, the separation of parent drop-off and visitor traffic from bus traffic is a common uh, theme that you see in, in an ideal situation when it comes to schools. Um, so we are doing the same thing here. The bus and drop-off loop and staff parking would be through this circuit back here, entrance, exit, and um, would allow that traffic to remain separate. A separate entrance for kids coming off the buses would occur right here at this part of the building uh, as well to facilitate that. Also, you see uh, the field area. The field area would be is proposed to receive turf so that those two fields can lay over each other and even the possibility of a third field is being looked at in the layout that would be created up in this corner uh, here as an overlay. So um, part of what's being constructed here is, is a variety of spaces and I'll show you the plans, but this is an image that illustrates one of the common spaces that's being proposed at the 5-6. You see the, uh, the stair, this is actually an example from a project that Fielding Nair, our associated architecture firm, uh, has done in another circumstance, and, and this is a feature that has multiple purposes. It can be used for large gatherings, evening activities, but also multi-class gatherings during the day. It can be used as informal space, as you see the kids doing here during a lunch or during an activity area. And the common theme that you'll see in the 5-6 design and the high school design is one of flexibility, providing a diversity of spaces, a mixture of large, small, and some open spaces that work together with each other. Uh, this is absolutely not what you would refer to or in the past is referred to as an open school. This is not an open school. This is really about flexibility and diversity of spaces. So a teacher with a class can have that class in a, in a traditional classroom uh, doing certain things. Different kids or small groups can break out into areas nearby. They can be monitored by the teacher, but those multiple areas are designed to work together. And the diversity of spaces that we're trying to create in these designs facilitate that much better than the traditional classroom, classroom, classroom on both sides of a hallway uh, where you'll often see kids taking tests or doing other activities or trying to do those activities in a hallway like this, which is really not conducive to that purpose. So the floor plan you see in front of you, I'll just kind of walk you through. The main entrance to the building is here. This is Valley Road. This is Witherspoon down this side. So this area of the building is, is kind of the academic wing. It's a two-story plan. So you see several groupings of spaces. So you, the blue areas are classrooms. The green area is, is called a Da Vinci Studio. It's a kind of a science classroom, an area where, where a range of activities could happen. And um, in each one of these groupings of classrooms, you see an open common space. You see several smaller spaces here and here that uh, kids and small groups with teachers and individually can break out and do different activities in while classes are in session. You also have several teacher collaboration rooms. So these are rooms where um, teachers can have a space to work together, to share resources, to meet, to have um, coordination sessions, and even activities with students, parents, and so forth if needed. And um, there are several of these groupings on each floor, here, here, and here. The main entrance with the office area um, a secure vestibule and entry where visitors can be controlled and check-in can be elevated from what it is in some of the schools currently. And that same setup would be created at the other elementary schools around the district. This uh, administrative and office block here is right off of what we're calling the heart. So this is kind of the main commons, the main center, the main place where kids will come in, circulate, everybody will flow through and activities will happen in this space. It's adjacent to the cafeteria, so these two spaces can work together for large gatherings, for big activities, and different types of things going on. Um, both of these buildings try to embrace a series of indoor and outdoor learning opportunities. So this, this side back here, which faces south, would have some outside learning space, play areas down here off of the gymnasium. These two areas are a greenhouse and um, a flex space, which could also be used for food type activities and different types of learning lessons that the, um, the various grades and, and teachers and students would share. The fields are over here, so um, there's a couple of uh, small locker rooms. 
bathrooms that can be accessed from the outside, basically spaces that can support that field use when the school is open, but also when the school is closed. So on a weekend and so forth, access to bathrooms and those support storage and so forth can occur there. Going up to the second floor, similar layout on this end of the building with the different learning zones. Um, the media commons, the media center is, is right here in the middle. So it overlooks the common space, the heart, and is right in the middle of the school for access and activity uh, to happen through and around it. These spaces down here are art spaces, uh, art spaces here, music spaces down here, and a flexible space that can be art and or different activities, learning activities, community activities, groups that might come in and work with students and things of that type. And the area you see here is this, the, uh, the gym is obviously a two-story space. So there are two outdoor areas on the second floor, this one on, um, that faces Valley Road, accessible out of the art areas so that you know, outdoor sculpture and those types of activities would have a place to happen. And the same thing back here, facing south, connected to the learning commons and to these other learning spaces uh, to the left of the plan. So the emphasis here is, again, on a range of spaces, support for teachers, diversity of learning environments, different activities that can happen together and be facilitated together, be monitored and worked with by the teachers and the students alike. Now the high school, the high school obviously, it's a great image. The high school has a great uh, uh, visage on the outside of the building, great historical uh, tradition in the community. Inside the building, it does face some challenges. Uh, and again, you have many, many spaces in this building that haven't changed in a very, very long time. And uh, you have quarters that are overloaded, that uh, have very limited access to daylight. So they are dark, they're very crowded. You have activities that actually happen in the quarters, which, which again, like you imagine this building here, Kids eat in the corridors. There are activities of breakout activities where kids are coming out of classrooms and trying to work in the corridors while, while other kids are circulating. Yeah, there are some challenges and it makes for a very difficult situation, a very crowded situation in the building. So specifically, we looked at doing a couple of things. Although a range of design options was looked at for the high school, uh, we settled on this concept, which is we're, we're kind of talking about expanding inward. So the, the high school has three courtyards right now. There's a courtyard here, here, and here. And all three of those courtyards are really not, not utilized for anything. They are outdoor space. They allow natural light into the adjacent classrooms, but that's about all they offer the high school currently. Given the situations with the site, there's a, you know, a, a severe shortage of parking and uh, obviously the need for more fields than can be provided on that site. So any addition to the outside of the building would compromise one or both of those circumstances. And that's why this solution was appealing partially for that reason, that expanding inward does not push into those already challenged areas around the building. Secondly, it allows us to create, connect these new kind of hubs that we're creating and use those to replace, in a way, the existing corridors, which are small and uh, very crowded. So now we're creating very large circulatory spaces that have a mix of uses. They allow people to move from area to area. They also allow different activities, both informal education and additional classroom and formal education, to happen by creating additional space in the building. So these circulation zones have, are filled with different activities and different learning spaces. And the classrooms, which, t which before were on both sides of a corridor, for example, that ran through here, those classrooms are now being opened in the other direction to these spaces that we're creating. So the corridor now becomes a mixture of circulation in that between the classrooms in that zone. But also, we're creating some common areas, some open common areas, so that flexible learning can happen in those areas as well. Uh, this is an example of how we're going to develop one of those courtyards. Um, this is the heart, which is the courtyard, the main courtyard right here. So a secure entrance, a new entry area would be created, and that would lead into this uh, common and heart space here. So at the, at the main entry level, you would enter the building. Security exercise would, would take place. The entrance to the heart would happen here, and this space includes a large gathering stair, similar to what you saw in the picture. So uh, a teacher, for example, who has several math courses could bring their classes together here, do a common lesson, and then different activities might break up and happen in different places or at different times during the day, as well as large gatherings and other activities. 
uh, visitors, uh, visiting uh, you know, counselors and others from colleges could do presentations here. It provides an opportunity for those types of things, which is really tough to facilitate in the high school currently. So um, this is the main level. This is a level up. So creating, a, um, in each of these courtyards, a three-story layering. So the, the level above that, the terrace that you see here, has several small group rooms. It also has some areas where kids can work individually and then into small groups. And it's pulled back to the edges because all of these courtyards would be skylit from above. So we're going to bring in an increased amount of natural light. Um, natural light like you have in the quarters now, but by opening up the classrooms next to it as well as this space that can be used, we're, we're expanding the number of classrooms and the amount of space that has access to natural light and creating circulation space that has access to natural light. So this is a, uh, an image at the top of that gathering stair. This is what the uh, looking down into the lower part uh, might look like. You see the, uh, the skylight space above, the gathering stair here. This is another image from one of the other courtyards. Uh, this is the, uh, the courtyard back here, you see, the south courtyard. So facing that, it would be a series of, of different activity areas. This is set up with tables right here, uh, up to the main level where there are uh, desks and, and seating areas here and breakout areas. And then again, the third level here, which all of which connect to the classrooms on either side. Uh, specifically, this connects down to the cafeteria, which currently is a fairly isolated space. So it allows us to bring natural light down and get natural light down into the cafeteria in a, uh, an enhanced way as well. So uh, we've worked very closely with the, uh, the team at the high school to make sure that while we're providing a greater diversity of spaces, we're also providing the capacity and the specific program spaces that are needed. So you'll see here at the heart space, there are several classroom instructional spaces being added. These are the other two courtyards back here, which also are receiving additional or, or being used to provide additional programmable classroom type space. Um, at the upper level, you see, a, again, a number of changes in different, different classrooms. So these rooms, you see some common areas being created, and they open up onto the heart area being created here, and this courtyard being created uh, or infilled on this side. So those classrooms now can function as a group, and they also can connect more easily with these other spaces that are being created. Uh, again, similar circumstances on the upper level. So the capacity at the high school is being increased to uh, you know, roughly 2,000, depending on how it's programmed. And um, that allows us to absorb that 5 to 10 and a little bit more in terms of uh, the projected enrollments to give the school a little bit of breathing room and a little bit of flexibility as growth continues. So uh, within those courtyard spaces, those are highlighted here. You'll see uh, several rooms, several distinct educational spaces that are being created in there. Same with these courtyards here on the different levels. So this is part of how we're using the courtyards both to open up the building and to add additional capacity space without increasing the outside footprint of the building there as well. So um, as the superintendent mentioned, the, uh, the costs have come down. We're, we're, I'll show you the details on the costs in just a moment. But um, in round figures, about $129.8 million, which is down from the $135 plus million we talked about last time. The cuts to get us to that point were not arbitrary. So we made very careful selections in terms of looking at the individual spaces in the building, specifically areas where we were not changing walls, we were not reconfiguring rooms, and reducing the amount of money that was being invested in the renovation of those spaces. So these are classrooms that are used as classrooms. They will continue to be used as classrooms. They're continuing in the plan in the same configuration. So certain upgrades will be made for code. For example, we're adding sprinklers in the building. Uh, doors and hardware will be upgraded for security. But the rooms themselves, in these cases, will remain and will look fairly similar to, to what those rooms do now. And this was an opportunity to, to trim back the scope we had, we had uh, proposed for those spaces whilst not losing any capacity space that we're creating in the building. So in this plan and the ones I'll show you, the dark blue areas are the areas that represent where that savings was captured. So this is on the, uh, the main level. These are uh, science-related spaces up here. On the upper level, similar here, okay? The areas on the, uh, what I'll call the south side of the building and then um, uh, down here as well. And then on the upper level, again, a series of classrooms where we're taking that step. And that's where those savings came from. So we looked very carefully at each room in the building, and those seemed to make the most sense in terms of where we could capture 
and reduce the scope and capture some of those savings. So additional steps, we talked about uh, athletic improvements, so specifically at the high school campus, uh, the lacrosse field, this is the field if you go out the gym, the one directly next to the tennis courts, uh, would receive turf. There would be netting constructed there for safety so that the, uh, the balls are not crossing over into other areas. Uh, there is a concession that's going to be created near the stadium to provide bathrooms and a small concession area and storage space, which I'll show you where that would go. Uh, improvements around the tennis courts to, to prevent the water from draining across them and wearing them out. Um, the fitness gym at the high school, this is an internal change, but the fitness gym at the high school right now is a high base space with fitness equipment on the lower level. So we're actually going to build an interstitial floor. So that space will now, about half of it will become a two-story space. And within that, we're going to create a space that could be used for various functions, wrestling, fencing, and general fitness and aerobic activities could also happen. And we're expanding that area to um, create additional teaching stations within that space as well. Uh, basketball backboards being replaced, indoor water fountains near the gyms, that area where there's a lot of activity doesn't actually have water fountains nearby for the kids. Uh, the bleachers will be motorized so that it will reduce the wear and tear on them and make the space more flexible. It can be turned over to different uses more quickly. And uh, as I mentioned, wrestling, fencing, and so forth happening in that converted uh, fitness space. At JW, um, upgrades to the fields, dugouts, backstops, uh, water access, again, would be brought out to the field areas where it isn't, is not currently available. Upgrade of the scoreboard and in the gym, uh, motorizing of the bleachers there. And at Valley Road, as I showed you on the plan, the uh, turfing of the fields, uh, the potential for an additional field overlaid there, as well as upgrades to the fields that are in place, and um, access to water and storage and bathrooms um, at that location as well. So in terms of the district administration, there are two pieces, as I mentioned, to relocate them from Valley Road. There's the maintenance and transportation offices and bus parking, which would happen at a new, new property. Uh, this would be a property that was, uh, the board is in the referendum seeking permission to purchase, uh, located on Herontown Road, and I'll show you the layout for that. And a facility would be constructed there as well as parking. And then the addition to uh, JW would uh, facilitate the other portion of administrative office functions, and that would be connected to that uh, old library space so that multi-use room could be captured and utilized. So specifically the transportation and operations offices and the bus parking, this is a layout of uh, the site. So um, location-wise, 206 runs here. Herontown connects with 206 and connects with Mount Lucas. The site plan you see here is based on a prior approval that was obtained from uh, the current owner for this site. So we've been careful to keep to the parking perimeter that was laid out so that we can facilitate a consistency with that approval uh, as this project would go through site plan approval with the township. The building you see here in the middle, about 9,000 square feet for office uh, space, a shop, some storage. Uh, that building is actually smaller than the previously approved building on that site. Again, trying to make sure that we're in a position to get approval without uh, problems and not creating issues with the neighbors and or the township. And bus parking and parking for the operations here would occur on this site. At John Witherspoon, uh, this is uh, the front of John Witherspoon here. The current entrance is right here. Parking on this side, the high school campus is over here, Walnut Lane. So an addition would be placed right here in this uh, part of the site. Uh, up against the building, we would create a, a light well so we don't lose windows. But the main entrance here to the school would be maintained and a new secure vestibule created that would serve both the office functions and the school functions in that location. Uh, a connection between this area and that space within the building to allow that multi-use and the ability to put more parking on the front corner of the site because parking obviously is at a premium in that part of the uh, township across those two campuses. And then this is uh, a view of the high school. So the high school building itself is here. This is the lacrosse field that would receive turf. And this is the current track and stadium with the bleachers on this side here. So the concession stand is proposed to be located in this area. Fairly simple building. It would provide bathrooms, men and women. It would provide a flex space here. Would not be heavily outfitted, but groups that are going to uh, operate concessions could operate out of there. And some storage space for um, the functions that would happen in that part of the site. So in terms of schedule, 
Um, the goal primarily here driven around the 5-6 school. Uh, this is a tight schedule that we're targeting. That's why the referendum coming up in October. Uh, the goal would be to have that 5-6 school operating by fall of 2020. Now, the caveat on that is obviously we need to be able to facilitate administration moving out of here so demolition and construction can happen. So temporary space arrangements will have to be made. We don't have the details of that worked out yet, but we are working on that. Um, the high school is the longer piece in this schedule. So the high school is a longer construction window for two reasons. One, uh, it's going to be a very complex project. It's going to be phased. We would do the courtyards first, and then we would do the learning zones in phases over time so that we try to minimize the impact on what's happening in that building. Um, secondly, it's also stretched out because that is part of why we were able to achieve a lower tax impact by stretching out the, the issuance of the bonds over a slightly longer period of time. That allowed us to not issue them all at once and bear that cost immediately, but issue it as a series of three issues that we'll talk about. And that's part of why the tax impact was able to come down as well. So in terms of the costs, um, the first five items at the top, which consist of uh, renovations at the various elementary schools, uh, security and so forth that we talked about, as well as the renovations that would happen at the middle school, uh, those improvements total about $15.3 million. That number has not changed from what you have seen previously. The change in the number is right here. So the high school is where the changes occurred from the numbers you saw previously. So the high school came down to about $56.5 million. Uh, the new school, that number remains the same. The fields, turf, athletic improvements, the two administrative improvements, those numbers also have not changed. So in aggregate, the total has come down to 129.8 for the changes at the high school, as I, uh, as I showed you. Um, so what do these numbers represent? These numbers represent a total project budget, and that includes hardened uh, material, labor, bricks and mortar, but it also includes soft costs. And those soft costs represent anywhere from 23 to 26%, depending on the project, a little bit higher at the high school, a little bit lower at the elementary schools. And that includes about half of that is contingency. Um, you know, we have in many cases older buildings. We are going to open the walls and we are going to find things that we didn't expect to find. That's the reality of construction in older buildings. So the contingency is there for very good reasons. But um, the, the goal is obviously not to spend all that contingency. We're going to try and uh, deliver this project without having to utilize that. And there's a very extensive uh, design and engineering process that would happen, but doesn't happen until after the referendum is successful. Uh, currently, we're just at the beginning of that design process because of what we are required to do to make submissions to the Department of Education. The, um, the budgets also include furniture allowances, specifically at the high school and the 5-6 school, and a variety of other soft costs for fees, legal costs, bidding costs, and the various types of costs that districts encounter when they do projects of this type. So breaking the cost down a little bit differently, there's about $5.1 million here that's um, dedicated to improving safety and security in the various buildings. You have HVAC improvements, heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. Uh, you see how that breaks down into a couple of different numbers here, about $11.8 million total. Athletics, which consists of the field improvements, the outside improvements we talked about, but also the inside improvements, the conversion of the fitness space and some other things. So you add those together, it totals up to about $11.6 million. And various other improvements, the new schools, the high school improvements outside of those things is the balance there. Now, the number you see at the bottom, we've also talked about at the past meetings, we did identify other improvements that the district either needs or can make. So for example, upgrading of lighting to LED lighting and things like that. These things can be grouped into projects that are called an ESIP, uh, an energy savings improvement project. And specifically, anything that saves energy can qualify for that. And in aggregate, if we can package improvements that pay for themselves in 15 years or less, we can take those pieces out of the referendum. So that $19.5 million doesn't contribute to the cost of the referendum. It gets bonded and advanced separately and is done so effectively without a cost to the taxpayer because the savings are calculated very carefully. There's an approval process with the state where those numbers are verified. And then that project gets bonded separately with the bonds being paid off by the savings over a series of years, 15 years or less. ESIP projects have been uh, a success for school districts in the state for about the last five or six years or so. 
uh, can be a very effective way to get things done without contributing to the dollar value of a referendum where you have to put that capital money out. Because there are energy savings, tangible energy savings, that will come from various improvements, lighting, certain uh, pump improvements, HVAC improvements that can pay for themselves. So the process related to an ESIP will run in parallel with the process related to the referendum. So um, tax impact, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that. This is a, an overall schedule. I'm going to blow up uh, the area right here so that you can hopefully sort of see the numbers a little bit better. Um, so um, I, I'm going to let our uh, financial uh, person, Brian, talk about this. But just to highlight a few things, you previously heard us talk about uh, a couple of tax impact numbers. So there were a number of tax impact numbers talked about over the first few years of the bonds. Uh, there is an overlap with bonds that the district is, is finalizing the payoff on. So the tax impact is a little bit higher at the initial years. But the average impact over the 30 years of the bonds whereas the previous number was estimated at 167 in additional tax impact. The current number here is $53.49, so about 53 and a half. So a substantial reduction that's attributable to a number of factors, which I'll let Brian uh, explain. Thank you, Scott. Um, so as Scott mentioned, uh, we were able to get the tax impact down to approximately $53. Uh, there are a number of uh, factors uh, that led to that, um, one of which was the idea of issuing three separate bond series um, over the life of the drawdown schedule. Uh, in order to do these projects, as he mentioned, uh, we don't need the full amount on day one. Uh, it's phased in over a number of years, so we can time the bond issues accordingly. Uh, what that does is it stretches out the payments over a longer period of time, and that reduces the av average annual impact. Um, you know, the numbers we ran here are conservative estimates, um, you know, based on uh, the current uh, interest rates uh, with some cushion in there as well. Um, and again, these numbers are very preliminary. Uh, they're subject to a number of factors that will change over time. Uh, such as uh, the interest rate environment and other market factors, uh, the final project costs and drawdown schedule, uh, the various debt service offsets uh, that you see. Uh, in this particular scenario, we were assuming 2.4 million in debt service offsets. Uh, those numbers represent potential savings to the district uh, through a bond refinancing. Uh, as well as interest earnings uh, from the project uh, costs. As I mentioned, you borrow all the funds. You can borrow funds on day one, but you don't spend them for a number of years. So you can invest those earnings uh, and use that to offset uh, the debt service on an annual basis in the budget. Uh, and then also the ultimate debt service aid figure, you know, um, will be set by the state after we submit the package to the Department of Education. Um, so we'll know that number for sure after that, and that can change. Um, we also highlighted here the next four years of tax impact. Uh, as you can see, the 2020 year has the highest impact there. Uh, but moving forward, it does decrease substantially uh, as the current debt service uh, falls off and uh, nets to that $53 uh, number of the tax impact. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, so for 2020, uh, the number is $295. For 2021, again, $295. Uh, for 2022, it's $693. And for 2023, it's $220. It will be posted to the meeting. Um, and we, we also, um, you know, we looked at a couple other scenarios. Uh, this represents the straight uh, drawdown. Uh, there's other options that you'll see in that document online uh, when you look at it that include um, various other drawdown patterns. And what that would allow you to do is just time the bond issues differently uh, when you're borrowing different amounts at different times. Uh, therefore, it's changing uh, the 
debt service off offsets from the project fund earnings and also the debt service cost and the timing of when that comes on uh, into the budget. So I would also just add the numbers you're hearing. Uh, these are representative of the estimate additional tax, additional annual tax impact for the average assessed home in Princeton, which the average assessed home value is 837.074. So obviously your home may not match exactly the average assessed home value, um, but that $53.49 that's associated with that average value is, what's the, what's the, uh, the number per 100,000? But that's just for the overall debt, right? Do we have, we don't have a 30 year number for the average. So we may need to add that to the information on the, well the 5349 is for the average assessed home value. Um, but you were looking for a number per hundred, which is not on, I apologize, is not on this sheet, yeah. So our goal, um, our goal tonight is for the board to consider uh, acting to approve the submission of these projects to the Department of Education. Uh, we have a process that's involved with the department that takes several months for their review, um, but our submissions are ready to go in, and our goal is to get them in so that we can protect the, the, the uh, date, the October 2nd date for a referendum. We have to have the department's approval about 60 days prior to that date because there are advertising requirements and so forth that have to occur. So that's, uh, that's where we are this evening. And with that, we can move on to uh, questions. That, thank you, first of all. Mm -hmm. That's, as usual, a great presentation. That date that we are aiming for, is that a hard and fast date with the state? Or is that a hard and fast date if we want to have a referendum on October 2nd? So we're, we're really at a point where we're at a hard and fast date in order to protect the October 2nd date. Uh, and the reason for that is that the department's approval process, uh, we need to have their approval by the beginning of August. So we're cutting them fairly closely at this point. So if we submitted this information, that was a, maybe a, a little bit, we took more time to think about it and make some adjustments and to be more secure in what we were proposing. If we did that in six months, what would that mean? So if you waited to submit for six right, months? So this is April. So if let's say we submitted it to the department in October, what would that mean in terms of um, when we could have a referendum? So you're allowed to have a referendum five times during the year, four special dates and once uh, in November uh, and overlap with the general election. The, five, the four special dates are uh, the end of September this year because of holidays, it happened to be shifted to October 2nd, uh, mid-December, mid-January, and mid-March. So from the date you submit to the Department of Education, we usually estimate about five and a half to six months for that process, which is partially the department's review and then the 60-day window prior to the election. So we're right at that five and a half month uh, point right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I guess, Brian, could you also clarify with, because I've gotten some questions on the October, on the October referendum date, how that impacts bond issuance dates and then state aid that, um, that comes back sure. to us? Sure, sure, absolutely. Uh, so the numbers that we had prepared tentatively assumed a November uh, issuance date of the bonds. In order to receive state aid in the budget, um, so for example, um, in the uh, 2020 budget in order to receive state aid for debt service in that year, you would need to sell the bonds by December 31st of 2018. Uh, that number needs to be provided to the state in order for them to do their budget and therefore give you the state aid. Uh, so that's another uh, reason why it's uh, important to do the referendum in October so that you're in a position to, to issue the bonds and get that debt service aid in that year. If it were to slip, um, there is a chance that you would not be able to get the debt service aid in that year, uh, which would just further increase the tax impact. Can you estimate the increase in that? I think Mary did last time, but do you have it at your fingertips, like what the impact would be if we missed state aid this year? 
Uh, so the state aid, the first state aid installment is roughly $500,000 uh, based on these preliminary projections. Um, I don't have what that means in terms of a tax impact right in front of me, but it, uh, you know, it would, it would increase the, the debt service by roughly uh, 20%. So, so it's course, a very meaningful number yeah, relative to the cost of running a special election. Uh, right. I mean, really meaningful relative to the cost of a special election. Like, right? So I just want people ask that question, why are we running a special election for, for this? And that's a big reason right there. So I just wanted to make that clear. Sure. Okay. I so this is boards, just for, for clarification, we're going to do public comments next. Um, so this is the time for the board to question the presenters. So just if we can keep it to board questions at this time. Okay, my question is for S Scott. It's not public S Scott, I was surprised to see the high school renovations were pushed back until the fall of 2019. Is there anything in the submission that would prevent the district from starting work at the high school in the summer of 2019, assuming the referendum passes? So the, the schedule we've envisioned there, um, the high school, due to the complex nature, will have an extended design and engineering period. Um, however, we may be able to do certain things, renovations, specifically uh, mechanical renovations, security renovations, things like that might be able to happen uh, in advance of that. So yeah, that is possible, uh, that some work might be able to begin in that summer. Thanks um, for the presentation. I had Two questions. Um, one related to what Michelle said. I, I do believe the October referendum also allows us a better potential to open the new school in September of 2020. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, it and does. And that is when we do imp we we know an enrollment um, crunch is coming at that point, and having the new school open for that school year is beneficial. Correct. Okay. Um, I also had a question about the high school schedule. Thank you for for writing it out. Thank you also for really giving a lot of time to, we're really appreciative of the efforts to lower the cost and minimize the tax impact. As I've said before, I do believe this is a responsibility and an opportunity. So I noticed that as Daphna did, there'll be a freshman class that enters the high school in 2019 and exits just as the high school work is done in 2023. So if we stretch this work over four years, which certainly has a beneficial tax impact, I'm thinking about the teaching and learning in, the, in that space for specifically that class of students who will live through the entire in, um, construction, but also for the teachers in the building. So I'm wondering, you mentioned to, that you'd start with courtyards. Does that maximize benefits? Will there be benefits to the students and teachers at the outset? And then when and how will this work get done over the four years? Uh, so I promise you it will be exciting for them. <laughs> um, so the the goal of, uh, yes, so the, so the goal of doing the courtyards first is that that allows us to create some swing space to relieve or make less complex the renovations of the existing spaces around the buildings. Um, so you know there there may be, as we talked about a, a moment ago, there may be some things we can advance, you know, early so that there are some things that they begin to see. But the courtyard construction is anticipated to take you know twelve a little bit more in terms of months and time. So there's a little bit of time involved there in terms of how that would proceed before that usable space would be available. But is there anything in the submission that is going to require us to do the high school over four years? And so my concern is that we're missing next summer, um, which is a, a few months that I'm sure we could get significant work done. I know that you're thinking of um, softening the tax impact, but again, back to the students and the teachers and the reason why we're doing this. Um, you know, I'm concerned the more I learn about the high school, the more, the more like today I found out that there's asbestos in the floors. I never knew that you could put asbestos in floors. I'm very con and that those floors are deteriorating. Very concerned about that, and I'm concerned that we're going to delay um, fixing those things to um, soften the tax impact. By it's it's not a significant enough savings to me to to do that. Well, it's not just uh, about the tax impact. Uh, it's also about the costs. Uh, this will be a complex project. The design time uh, is longer by necessity because of the amount of work that needs to be done, the investigative work uh, in the buildings to make sure that we're 
you know, finding out where all the pipes and everything that's there now run, structure, and so forth, so that we can design it in a way that keeps the cost down as much as possible and facilitates the construction as effectively as possible with, without having any more impact than necessary. Now, that said, you know, our goal would be to tighten up that schedule, but there's going to be a balance that we would work out with you in terms of the details, and that's going to be a balance between accelerating the schedule and achieving a, an impact that um, the teachers and the students and the functions at the school can live with. It's a balance that on any project of this type we work through, but that more than anything is going to dictate the schedule. So we're not committing today to a four-year schedule. That's just This is just a suggestion? Correct. Approximation? Correct. Yeah. We will continue to look at the schedule just as we have uh, the majority of the design and engineering work okay. yet to do. That will all happen at the same time uh, after the referendum. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So I'd just like to clarify for maybe folks in the room who weren't here prior, like um, Dr. Sharma, who signed up to speak tonight, mentioned last time having a detailed construction plan, which I know is coming. And just so with respect to what we're voting on tonight, just to clarify, we're voting on to put this plan with a maximum dollar amount into the Department of Education for review. The construction schedule, the plan, details within that plan, cost savings that may occur around that plan are all to be decided and worked on at a later date. This is really a filing deadline more than a plan completion deadline. Am I saying that correctly? Yeah, well, this is a filing deadline, and the submission to the Department of Education, you're correct, just as the referendum number effectively establishes a cap for the district. You're not allowed by law to spend any more than that referendum amount. So that's why we've included contingency and so forth. But uh, obviously, continued refinement of the schedule, of the details around the scope, and so forth will happen as the project, the full design effort post-referendum moves forward. Thanks. And just also to piggyback off, oh, oh I'm sorry. so sorry, Evelyn. <laughs> just to piggyback off of uh, Pat's question, and, and this is a question to both of you, because we did hear last week uh, some talk about how the private sector does things more efficiently, that, that this process is, is so clunky. And I wanted to ask both of you, in my mind, this is an example of a public sector project that's designed differently to be as collaborative as possible and to allow input from the community and from all of us. So is this different from other large projects you've worked on in the past and, and helped guide in the past? Or what are the benefits of, of moving the way we're moving now? Well, so the benefits are, um, you know, the deliberative process, the input process allows us to, to make sure the projects advance as smoothly as possible and design-wise are as effective as possible in terms of what they deliver. Um, you know, private projects tend to move a little bit faster but they also don't necessarily have that level of input involved in them, that back and forth with the public and with the teachers and students and so forth. So yes, there are differences, but those differences can sometimes lead to a better result. Um, this process that we've laid out here that we're talking about is, is similar to the same process we go through with any public school project in, in the state. And this will... How, how long will this allow the public to continue to be a part of this collaboration moving forward? So the intention is that that public collaboration, the seeking of input, the, the periodic reviews that will happen, that will happen all through the design process that follows the referendum. So this is not the end of the public input process. This is um, just the first phase. And then if the referendum passes, full design kicks in, and that process will again pick up in a fair amount of detail as it has been over over the uh, last you know year or so. Okay. Um, going off what uh, Pat said, and I know what uh, some of the um, public has talked about with the design process, um, this has been a very collaborative uh, effort and not everyone has been a part of that. So I want to thank you for your patience and working uh, with the other architectural firm and for working with this board and for patiently listening to all of the stakeholders involved. Um, it was a pretty tall order at the high school with what you were given. Um, this board is pretty far down the road with uh, their strategic plan. And the high school is doing some pretty grand things. Mm -hmm. um, having Heidi Hayes Jacobs uh, here uh, was 
um, also a wonderful addition to be able to have the architects and to have an educator of her status um, with Steve's vision. Um, I think this, uh, not everyone is privy to all of that and this board is fortunate to have ridden uh, this uh, journey uh, from, from the start. So a lot of uh, kudos to the board for um, all the energy and effort and the foresight uh, to look at uh, the high school. You're not changing the footprint of the high school. I think that um, that's good foresight. If the enrollment goes down, the high school has been there for 120 years? 125? Roughly. 90 years. 90 years. 90 Almost years. 100 years. So not changing the footprint um, strategically is a very, very sound move and, and very good for the community. So I really do like your design. I think it's thoughtful. Um, I think you're looking at security. As I research security in Cranberry, as we look at our own uh, building, um, I do think it's a thoughtful design. Um, and I think that we don't want you to go into the details of construction until we see if the referendum is going to pass, if the state's going to give it to us, because quite frankly, we don't want to pay you for all of that until we're certain that we can um, go forward. So to answer the questions that um, some of the members of the public said, how come it's not buttoned down? How come we can't see specific drawings in detail? Well, we don't do that until we're sure that um, we have the funding and we have the go ahead. Um, then we can pay you to do um, the, the more finesse and uh, because that's costly uh, to the district. Um, but we're, I'm very confident that you'll do it to the finest details. So thank you. Good. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, yes, yeah. I have a few. So I just want to make sure I understand. I know we get state money for renovations and versus new construction, but that's already been taken account at the $129 value, correct? So the state share money doesn't show up in the dollar value. The $129 is the dollar value. Where it shows up is that it impacts the tax impact. So. We've estimated the state share based on the amount of renovation and the amount of new construction, and they've considered that in the calculation you saw earlier. So if that state share were not there, that tax impact would go up. But that's because, because the state share comes in the form of um, debt service aid based on principal and interest that's paid. It's not a grant, per se, where they write you a check for a certain dollar figure. Mm -hmm. it, gets, it gets factored in on an annual basis in that debt service calculation. And so you figured that out, or I don't know who figures that out, but that's figured out before we even submit? No, we've estimated it so that okay. we can, um, we, we estimated we feel conservatively, okay. but we estimated so that we could use it to determine a, a reasonable tax impact uh, estimate. The, the New Jersey Department of Education will, uh, at the end of their review, they will issue an approval letter, presumably. That approval letter will set forth the debt service aid percentage that each project is eligible to receive. And they will establish the, the final numbers in that sense. OK. All right. So the other thing I was getting very confused about is, is I know we're sending all this. We want to send all this to the DOE. And then the way or the fact or how we can reduce the cost is very contingent on the not changing the design. And I'm just trying to really understand this. So. If we break it up differently, like if you just, and maybe you, I don't know if you can do this, but can you send like security is one issue and HVAC is one thing and um, high school but not security and HVAC so that if we want to change things in the high school, it's not affecting some of the other things. I'm just trying to see where the opportunity and the discussion still is to reduce the 129 oh, after right. today. So the the uh, what we need to do in order to, in order to protect the integrity of that review process with the Department of Education is remain consistent with the scope and uh, approach that we're submitting to them. Um, that said, we certainly will be making many many refinements as the design process goes through its the full design process post referendum. You know, input there will be a lot of refinement and a lot of development that will come from that. But um, what we need to do is we need to stay materially consistent with the projects being submitted so that the Department of Education approvals hold up. 
And that means that, you know, it's not that we can't make refinements, but, you know, substantial changes if we um, took a different design approach and, and decided to do an addition somewhere else or uh, so forth and so on. We, we would run afoul of that process, and we may have to then resubmit to the Department of Education. But we certainly have the ability to continue to refine these projects as the design process continues, and that's fairly typical for these projects. As a follow-up as a follow up to Debbie, suppose we decide to get rid of the generator hookups at the elementary schools, and we decide that in June. Is that something that can be done? So that's not and not a, that I'm against the generator hookups. I'm just trying to get some specifics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I understand. Um, I, I, that wouldn't really be a material change in the in the scope of the renovations at the uh, various schools. So, you know, that would be an example of something that wouldn't probably materially change the Department of Education process. What about the turfing of fields? So we, right now, I think we've listed two. Suppose we decided to do one. So. You have the ability to, uh, you're, you're submitting for the approval of the Department of Education so that you can move to referendum. But you do have the ability to, you know, not include certain things in that referendum. If you choose not to turf the fields, for example, even though those athletic improvements might be, might be approved, you simply don't put them in the referendum. So, you know, we're submitting as a series of submissions to the Department of Ed. It's not just one submission. We're submitting by school. In some cases, the high school has, has two submissions, one for the fields because funding is different, one for the building. Uh, Valley Road is a separate submission. Each elementary school is a separate submission. Uh, JW Middle School, the renovations are one submission. The administrative addition is another. Uh, again, mostly related to how the DOE reviews them and how the funding changes from one type of project to another. And the final, oh. I'm sorry. So can you give me examples of things I, we would be able to cut, like like at five, six, you know, can we get rid of the greenhouse and the food tech and just make, all, and it looked like there were three dance rooms, unless I was reading it wrong, and make them all just regular rooms. I'm just trying to figure out where there's going to be opportunity because what I, I understand the design and the mechanics and then we can't really change. And so... I mean, where do you, if you see if you that take, we could if, get... If you take that example at the 5-6 mm -hmm. school, right, um, you know, post-referendum and the design process, you, you could decide not to build the greenhouse, right? We're, we're submitting for an approval at a certain square footage and a certain maximum budget for that project. You can certainly choose to do less um, later on. You could certainly change that greenhouse to a regular classroom if, if that was where the design process led. You, you do have some flexibility. You're not locked in to nothing changing. However, prior to the referendum, in order to protect the DOE review process, you know, we have to make a decision on what to submit to them, and then we have to remain relatively consistent with that, you know, in, in terms of big or major changes. When you say what to submit, that's what we're approving today. That's what you're considering tonight, yes. So, so I'm, I'm tied. I'm very tied to the 129. I mean, I, I, I don't know that I'm I would not sure what put my, it that way. When, my buffer is. Well, when's so, the number decided that goes on the ballot? Is 129 the number that we put on the ballot in October, or is that refined in July when we decide on the ballot question? So assuming you advanced everything tonight to the DOE review process and assuming everything tonight remained in the picture, the 129.8 would be the number that's on the ballot, along with the state share figures and so forth. Um, now, you could always choose, for example, not to do the improvements at a particular school, and you simply, even though it's approved, you don't put that on the ballot, and you have the ability to change in that sense. The challenge comes in if you try to bifurcate the projects we're submitting tonight by saying, well, we only want to do the left half of this uh, project versus the right half. That creates a problem because the DOE has reviewed and acted on a specific scope, and their approval <laughs> represents a state share that reflects that scope. So. There is a line. I'm not trying to be vague, but it's not a hard line that I can point to and say this is where it's defined. I just know that we need to stay materially consistent with those submissions prior to the referendum. And can we just have a similar discussion about the financing terms? So when is the last time that we would have the, the opportunity to decide how you know, option one, two, or three? We're going to have this thing on the website, this sheet, which is very helpful. Um, 
and you know straight drawdown versus parts over three years or over four years. So mm. when is that kind of decision made? Uh, so we assume for this analysis that the first bond issue would occur in November of 2018. And as we mentioned previously, that is so you can secure the debt service aid for the 20 but 2020 budget. Uh, you know, you can really make a decision to finance it at any at any time. Mm -hmm. It would be uh, dependent on market rates, you know, at the time. Uh, if if we see that we're in a rising interest rate environment, we might try to sell the bonds quicker uh, than indicated on the sheet. Or if we there's some pressure that potentially rates could go down, you know, maybe we uh, delay the issue or, uh, you know, taking into the budget issues into concern as well. Um, it also is going to be dependent on the final cost and drawdown schedule. These three scenarios are based on three preliminary drawdown schedules. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have some flexibility to time the three bond issues, three or two. You know, obviously these are all decisions that could be made uh, in the future. Uh, but we have some flexibility to time them based on when we need the funds. Um, so again, it this lays out the three potential bond issues in, in November of 18, July of 20, and July of 21. However, those can be adjusted based on need, based on the current market, um, you know, and it will it really, the decision can be made, you know, as, as we go along. You're not locked into anything at any time. But is there a kind of a maximum tax impact, just like a maximum cost of the project? Uh, you're approving the cost of the project, not the tax impact. So. so we have the flexibility to adjust our financing to kind of keep the cost as low as possible given the market circumstances? Correct. And also, as we go forward, assuming there's approval in the referendum, we start to build and we're going to have maybe multiple tranches of debt. Um, say, my understanding is that we can't build any piece of the project until we have the money in the bank. So you know, even if there were to be a terrible market crash, say, and we've only taken two tranches, we have one more to go, we would then as a board make a decision at that time as to whether we could afford to borrow in that market environment and, and complete the project, right? Uh, yeah, I believe that would be the case. Um, yeah, if, if there was a certain, if it at the time uh, was disadvantageous for you to pursue that part of the project, uh, you could you know, choose not to finance I it. just want people to understand that there's so many different decision points Going forward, we're making one decision to submit now, and as Scott's just outlined, there's a lot of different choices, but even after, assuming we had approval and we knew the total cost of the project and we started moving forward, even then we would have dis uh, the ability as a board to make uh, appropriate decisions on behalf of the district if, if it somehow became unfeasible financially for the community. Right. right, or that the amount we were able to borrow didn't build what we needed it to build. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. Uh, these are preliminary numbers based on a, a number of moving targets uh, that'll, you know, over time as they get more, as we get more clarification, you know, we can adjust as necessary. Right. So these numbers that are going to be on the website involve kind of assumptions, conservative assumptions on interest rates, on uh, market conditions, on uh, yeah, yeah, the project cost, the drawdown schedule, the, de uh, the debt service aid, even. Right. You know. and, and also, I noticed um, on the rateables, mm -hmm. you took into account an assumption that our rateables in town would continue to grow for only three years, or how far out did you go? Uh, we assumed uh, an additional $20 million in rateables each year uh, through 2020. So through 2020, which yeah. we then have an additional, to what, 28 years of, of the of the debt outstanding. Sure, so presumably, right. hopefully, rateables would continue to grow somewhat during that time. Yeah, absolutely. We just used the, that $20 million based on um, uh, projects that we know are, are coming uh, online, and that right. we're pretty so certain that they'll occur. If rateables did continue to rise, then the cost per t to taxpayers per yeah, 100000 would, would decrease. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. I just wanted to actually thank both Brian and Scott for the hard work that you guys put in just six days after our last meeting and, and to make the changes to be responsive to what the board has asked. And I know that the work also includes work with, with the superintendent, with our business administrator. It's, it's a tremendous amount of work. And I also, on behalf of the board, want to thank you for walking us through detail by detail all the different contingencies here 
this is important stuff. This is hard stuff. I know it's taking a long time, and I appreciate everyone's patience, but I very much appreciate the, the willingness of both of you to do this for us. It makes our decision a lot easier. It makes it a lot easier for the public to understand as well. Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Scott. Is any other questions before we move Can to I the public? A few questions. Sure. Um, the design a few months ago on the addition to the high school, I keep going back, there was some dining space and 12 new classrooms, and that seemed like that was gonna take care of our space needs. Does the new design provide those spaces? Our sufficient space that it's equal to what we were gonna have then? Yes, it does. So the, the cost savings did not reduce any did not reduce or eliminate any capacity supporting spaces at the school. Okay. Um, the capacity at Valley Road and Princeton High School with what we're doing, do we have a feel for how long that works? I mean, I guess we only have demographics to 2025 or something like that, which are after a while to become suspect, but at least it goes through there. Do we have any feel for how much more many years it'll go after that? And the reason I ask is people have said, oh, will we be issuing bonds between 2019 and is it 2050? Is that how it works out? Um, Crystal so balls it, are tough to come by these days. Yeah. Um, so you know we we are limited in in our vision in the sense that we have a projection that takes us out uh, 10 years. It's the nature of projections. The further out you go, the less reliable because the fact the you know, number of factors that can change becomes you know increasing uh, increasingly impactful on those numbers. That said. Um, as the, uh, our friends from Fielding Nair have talked about at uh, various of the input sessions and so forth, what they have seen in buildings designed the way we're proposing is an increased amount of flexibility. So a greater ability to absorb changes in enrollments because of the number of spaces that can be utilized to deliver education in different ways. So um, as a result, I believe we have a little more flexibility than we might with just a standard classroom set up at the buildings. That said, we just really don't have a way of knowing for certain what enrollments will do, uh, you know, 10, 15, or 20 years down the road. We also talked, uh, you're gonna take care of the water issues at the PAC, and can you elaborate a bit on that? So our intention, um, the, the issue that, that has occurred at the PAC is, um, you, you, have a, you have a number of factors that contribute to the two retention basins at the high school um, overflowing or have overflowed in the past. So our intention is to um, elevate the containment on those retention basins and to improve uh, situations around the doors and so forth. We obviously can't lift the building, so we need to try to modify what we can modify to try and uh, contain the water that comes to those areas. We also have spent time talking with the township uh, about possible solutions in that area, and those, those dialogues uh, will continue in terms of uh, what solutions they might be able to offer or, and or improvements they may have planned that would help us uh, address that. So we'll continue that coordination uh, to try and reach the best solution. Do you feel like there will be a, a, really, a solution that's really likely to work? Well, I can tell you we'll put the best solution we can come up with into action, uh, yeah. but kind of like the enrollments, I don't have a crystal ball on rainfall in the future either. So I, I don't have a way of predicting whether water flow will increase, will change. Our goal is to try and mitigate it as best as possible with improving the factors we have control over. Um, we can't change the road, the draining system in that area and so forth. So. Uh, we are limited to a degree, but at the same time, I believe we can have a positive impact that will help you guys down the road. On your slides up here, you showed that the Valley Road field here would be turfed. And I couldn't tell if it was the entire field or just part of it. It's, it's the entire field, yes. Yeah. So you would have the varsity field, a soccer rectangular field, which could be used for various sports. And as we talked about, we're also looking at the potential that you would stripe in, um, you know, a, a softball type field in that in that area as well. But the entire area is budgeted to be turfed. And I have a question on turfing the lacrosse field at the high school, that field next to the houses on Moore Street. I, is there a big demand for that? Are people asking for that? And I'm not a lacrosse player and don't have any in my family, so I have no idea if it's a a good thing or a bad thing. So I don't know, Evelyn, if you're 
a lacrosse person, if you have any. I think I, I could answer yeah, that. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, just the fact that um, in making that turf currently, it's a practice field. So if we make it turf, then it's usable all the time, even when it rains, when the, <coughs> it's mud. Um, by putting the um, uh, the netting up, then the lacrosse team can use it and not jeopardize whoever is on the other field. So from a safety standpoint, the net needs to go there if the boys lacrosse team is there or the girls lacrosse team. So if you're going to put lacrosse up there and throw balls as fast as they throw them, you do need the netting. So that the boys team or the girls team, whoever is downfield, uh, are safe as the balls move. So the netting kind of goes uh, part and parcel with the field. But the what the turf gives you is uh, complete uh, use for longer period <coughs> earlier in the spring and uh, uh, just just greater accessibility and field use uh, on that field. It's not. It's really not practical for field hockey because it is just so lumpy and bumpy. Um, and uh, so I would I would say that uh, having turf gives you. Um, greater usage for all sports. Before we move on from the turf, um, Scott, I just want to make sure everyone understands with the 5-6 school, we're taking away part of the existing Valley Road field. Is that correct? Yeah, so the creation of the parking drop-off and drive area there does intrude into the current fields. So, um, you know, the turf offers, generally turf offers broader use. So even in the lacrosse example, when the lacrosse game's over, you could have a general aerobic or practice activity on that field right away because you don't create, you don't run down the grass and the wear and tear and the maintenance needs are not there. At Valley Road, turfing that area allows us to overlap those fields more than we otherwise would be able to. And therefore, even though we have a little bit less space, we're able to work in the fields that, um, that we're showing a little more effectively. No problem. I think maybe two more questions. So the concession stand building when I was looking at the numbers on it, it seemed like it was really high per square foot. And I was imagining a cement block building. And so I don't know if there's more to it than that or if it's just because it's out by itself that it's expensive. It, it's because it's out by itself. So we, we have to run utilities out to it and you know those types of connections. Um, but it really needs to be in that area because that's where the demand is. So that does increase the cost. Um, the building itself will will not be much more than you're describing, but at the same time, uh, its location and the fact that it's a relatively small building, so on a square footage basis, it's going to it's going to cost more as a result. And one last question, and maybe Brian, or I'm not, not sure who should answer it. You're talking about soft costs and some reductions and talking about rebond issuance. I'm not sure if I understand that. Are you saying we you might reissue bonds later in the future at a lower rate or something, or? Um, if you're referring to the, uh, some of the debt service offsets that we included, I think I mentioned a bond refinancing. Yeah. Uh, it's just outstanding bonds you currently have. I believe they're series 2009 they were issued. Um, so since they were issued in 2009, they're just bearing interest at rates higher than the current market environment. So you're allowed, uh, they have a 10-year, uh, what's a, known as a call provision. So you're allowed to call them back from investors and reissue new bonds at a lower rate uh, to pay them off. So you end up just uh, achieving some interest rate savings uh, on that over the remaining life. They only go out to 2022, so it's only another you know, four or five years left on those, uh, but you'll still achieve some savings per year, which we used in this analysis to offset the tax impact in those years. I don't think I have any more. Well, I guess the last question is, this: the vote tonight, I'm anticipating that between the vote tonight and the vote in July, when we decide the referendum questions, we're gonna be able to, in that gray area, affect the costs. And I know, Scott, you said that it's it's not a, a black and white line that you can tell us what's permitted and what's not. But yeah, I feel comfortable going forward tonight with this because I know that over the next, I don't know, was it four months or so, we'll get to play with the numbers. And I think that's correct, right? As long as we remain materially consistent. Materially, with yes. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that sounds so legal to me. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, but it's just got to be that yeah. way. <laughs> okay.
So yeah, as we uh, as we proceed to public discussion, Wait, can, as we proceed can, can to I vote, ask a few questions? I'd, I'd like to just okay. ask uh, one real one quick question again, which is if you both you gentlemen could then just repeat the 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 the, the average cost that you know our taxpayers are going to uh, bear over the next f over the four year the first four years of the bond referendum because that came down a lot and so I just want everyone to know exactly what the, the these numbers are and and you know where we are as we proceed to a vote. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, so just to reiterate, the uh, average annual tax impact uh, over the life of the bonds for per every 100000 is $76. Uh, to the average home, it's $641. Uh, in the next four years, uh, in 20, beginning in 2020, uh, it's $295 uh, incremental <laughs> increase in 2021. $294 incremental increase in 2022. It's a $693 incremental increase in 2023, a $220 incremental increase. Uh, those are all to the average home. Uh, and then the average annual incremental increase over the life of the term is $53. And that's the average home, which is assessed at just under 840000 and that means that the uh, the cost would drop from that 220 in year four, right? Uh, correct. Correct. Yeah, the incremental cost um, in those four years is the highest, and then after that, it's, it decreases substantially to get to that $53 uh, average figure. Okay, so uh, uh, if there are no further questions from the board, uh, again, who had a question? Yeah. Brian. One, okay, Brian. Sorry yeah, if I uh, sound a little bit weird. I'm still kind of sick right now. But um, I just had a few small questions. So at, at, do you know around when PHS growth is expected to hit the new 2,000 capacity set by um, the renovations? So the projections have us uh, escalating to that level in the 5- to 10-year period, closer to the 10-year period. So right now, the district is dealing with a substantial overcapacity issue uh, at the high school, but also at the middle school. And that middle school overcapacity is going to continue to grow and then push through the high school in the following years. Mm -hmm. um, another quick one is that the, with the Valley Road, like the traffic loop, it kind of reminds me to a similar traffic situation at one of my old middle schools because I used to live in Lawrenceville. And I remember that the traffic within the loop will, was at, was uh, kind of just a nightmare bottleneck situation. Do you foresee anything like that happening? Well, our, our goal is to try and create a, a layout that flows and can flow. Now, obviously, some control will have to happen in, in that area during drop-off and pickup periods. But the loop that you're seeing there allows us to move the traffic away, reduce the potential for that traffic to back up on Valley Road. Mm -hmm. And that's primarily the goal of that layout. And that was, um, that came from our discussions with the township. We also met with the police and emergency services personnel to understand their concerns about that. So that's what that's what's driving the loop. Um, you know, how that loop is managed, that, that will take some planning um, once it's implemented and some training of parents and others that are dropping off uh, kids, I'm sure, as well. So, yeah. um, I guess just one final question. Is there anything happening about water fountains, random, just out of random curiosity? In the high school? Yes, yeah, in the high school. I thought you might be asking about that. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, we are upgrading the water fountains. We mm -hmm. are also adding additional water fountains, um, specifically in... Um, the athletic area where they're really uh, tough to find right now. Uh, so that is part of the project. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Brian. So, again, just to reiterate one last time, we had a sign-up sheet for people who want to come up and speak, and we did it just so we can manage the time that everybody uh, has. It's ab about, given the math, uh, about two minutes per person. We ask that you just be respectful of your um, people behind you and that we keep to two minutes. Ms. Kennedy will run a timer. And uh, I think we'll go pretty much in order with the, the one caveat. Um, I see a couple of known high school students on here. Uh, there may be some unknown ones to me, but there's at least a couple here that I, I recognize. And, um, you know, there's a couple, few people, many of us on the board actually have been working on uh, over the years on reducing the homework load among students. And we've been, you know, marginally successful 
uh, recently, but still not as successful as you want to be. So being mindful of, of that um, and to let th these guys go if they, if they have to go um, get some work done. Yeah. Maybe in the future, future high school students can wait till the end because they won't have as much homework as they do tonight. But so I'd like to ask um, Matthew Dodds to, to come up and, and kick it off, if that's okay with you, Matthew. Hi. Hi. So if you can just come up to the podium. Um, if you can, and by the way, for all speakers, if you can just state your name, um, where you live, and it would be nice to know if, if you use the facility, you know, if you're a public school student, public sure. school parent, or, or not, it'd be nice to know that too. Um, all right, so I had uh, been coming mostly to speak of the expansion, but I will refer to that as well. Uh, I'm Matthew Dodds. Uh, I live on 34 Allison Road in Princeton, and I'm a PHS student, currently a senior. Uh, I've gone here for nearly four years now, so I have some experience with the whole setup. Um, as for the renovations, uh, I'd like to first echo the fact that um, th we do need to be expanding the, the school. Um, I imagine this is also equally true for the middle school and the elementary schools, but I've definitely seen that throughout my experience at PHS. Um, and some of the other issues that were mentioned as being planned to be uh, addressed during the renovations for the referendum, uh, I can, I've definitely witnessed as well. Um, the air conditioning systems and similar systems have definitely been kind of a consistent uh, problem to the point that uh, gym classes uh, become very, very difficult towards the end of the year and at the very beginning as you just kind of sit uh, inside and even in the attempts to air condition the place, it's just very miserable and you're sweating and there's nothing happening. Um, Right. Uh, as for the courtyards, they are effectively, in my perspective, and I'd imagine this wouldn't differ from other students, um, wasted space as of now. Uh, I've actually had about two experiences with the courtyards over my time as a PHS student, one of which was when I was looking for specifically isolated spaces for an English project, and the other one was when I discovered the existence of the third courtyard, um, because you can only access that through a door in classroom 161. <laughs> Which is not, there's no indication of that anywhere besides that. I just happened to enter that classroom and wonder where the door was going. It's a beautiful courtyard. It's got flowers, but it's, you, you don't use it. Um, right. So, what else did I have written down? Um, yeah, so um, the renovation project, as I've seen it, I don't really have any qualms with. I think it'd be very helpful. I'm sorry. Um, in every way that it's been discussed, the only concern that I might have uh, is specifically for the visual arts classrooms that have a very uniquely uh, set up space that I would like, and I would like those needs that have been already met in the current design to be addressed in that plan. Uh, I'd imagine that's a view shared by the other students who use those facilities in their classes or in other activities, and so that's a relevant voice. Um, Thank you, yes. Matt. I, I think I should have given you a little warning. We had a little timer Sorry. malfunction, but... Um, <laughs> But I'll give you a few minutes just to wrap up if you want to say anything else before um, we move on. Sure. Um, Seconds, not minutes. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> right. So that's effectively all I had as for the renovation. Um, but as was brought up in my introduction, I suppose, um, the, the efforts to reduce the workload on students, I think, will be very impactful should they take place and continue to take place uh, in student wellness as I have seen throughout the, the years of the high school, um, students become very overwhelmed with work. Um, there was a survey a couple of years ago about academic dishonesty that, um, and the exceedingly high rates of that uh, that came out in that survey I think are in significant part due to the sheer amount of work that is put on students at the, at the high school. Um, in ways that could be easily diminished. There's definitely um, a value to homework uh, to a certain extent, but I believe that it's, it's, it definitely is to a detriment at a certain point uh, as it currently takes place in PHS, and yeah, likely th this is echoed through other students' practice as well. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Matt. And um, if I can ask Charles Kreider to come forward again, if you can just identify yourself where you live, I guess we know. I guess we know you're a high school student. You come to the. Okay. All right then. Well, more efficient. More efficient. Very very good. Thank thank you for coming. And, yeah. Okay. So um, now 
continuing through the list, and I'll just do it in the order that you signed up. So, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, thank you. I'm going to take only 30 seconds, so. Oh, thanks. Sure. That's fine. Uh, uh, so up next is Adam Bierman. Yeah. Uh, f I actually like to congratulate Pat Patrick and the board and everybody and who worked so hard. So as I said, I will take only 30 seconds. I already shared my thought processes last week, and I also had a chance to meet with the board members. So I passed on my knowledge and experiences, and I appreciate the hard work everybody has done to sharpen the pencils, and I'm very hopeful that at the end of the day, we will have a good project. And uh, so thank you for having me, and uh, thank you, everybody. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. And uh, sorry, this is Adam Bierman, and up next is Chris Ayers. Oh, hi. My name is Adam Bierman, Princeton High grad, native. Um, one, I'm a little more hopeful now that I'm hearing some things about cutting numbers. Uh, uh, also, we don't need, in my opinion, this, a gold-plated school. It would be nice, but it could be a financial arm um, Armageddon for a lot of our residents. I've been canvassing a lot. And it's, I want diversity, and I want the best for our students, but I don't want to see people have to move out of their houses. Just to play the devil's advocate, though, I'm all for sports. I mean, believe me, I played at football and basketball at Princeton High. I was a lightweight football player. But do we need the AstroTurf right now? Do we need, um, you know, uh, the concession stand? No, I, I just don't think so right now. We survived. When I went to Princeton High, believe me, we had 23 students, one, 23 students to one teacher. We had more national merit scholars that you could sh than we had in mice. We also called the school Princeton Asbestos High School. We had the same problem then. And again, to play the devil's advocate, though, again, people feel burned from 2002. It was really bad. I know the fog of war. I'm not saying this is war, but the fog of construction, a lot can go wrong. And this is what we're dealing with. And finally, is it true, though, is the architectural firm being compensated based on their overall construction cost? If they are, again, it doesn't inspire confidence. I'm not saying anyone wants to do anything wrong, but still. And I'll leave it at that. And maybe another time, can I meet the board members individually? Can I set something up to talk to them? OK, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, thank you, Adam. So, um, just a just a comment in terms of um, I should have said this in the beginning, but as this is a time for public to make comments, and it's not really a cross examination of the of the board. Um, board reserves the right at the end, and I think we'd like to do that is just wrap up. And if any issues are raised that that we'd like to address, maybe a couple of you did. Okay, in my final twenty seconds, and I do appreciate <laughs> what you're going through. My dad was president of the school board, and believe me, I understand the complexities, the politics, and the emotions that are happening. So I appreciate your work. Oh, thank, thank you, thank you. Um, so with with that, it, next is uh, Chris Ayers, and and on deck is Mary Clerman. Hello, I'm Chris Ayers. Uh, I live on 14 Harris. I'm also uh, the head wrestling coach at the university, so I have a little bit of an agenda. It's pretty good. I followed him, I think. So, uh, <laughs> um, and I actually came here in support of my cranberry friends, but I guess that's on another meeting. But after here, <laughs> after here, but it, but it's been great watching you guys work. So. Um, Really appreciative of the work you guys have done. Uh, it was awesome to come in here. This is my first board meeting and see uh, how thorough everything is looked at. Um, and it gives me a lot of confidence in the decisions you're making. I actually feel bad coming up here having not really thought about this very much. And you guys are going through all these questions. But um, I do appreciate the fact that athletics is part of this referendum. Um, in my view, Athletics is absolutely an extension of the educational process. Uh, for me, uh, I went to Lehigh University. My parents, they didn't go to college. I'm a first-generation college kid. If I didn't have athletics, I wouldn't have went to college. So um, really appreciative of you guys thinking about athletics, not just, not just, the, um, not just the, the other things. <laughs> so uh, so I, really, I really appreciate that. I also appreciate you keeping the uh, second level of the – fitness center there because they, they need some up there. So thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Okay, uh, next is uh, Mary Clerman and on, and on deck is uh, Dina Shaw. Hi, Mary Clerman. I live across the field on the other side on Harris Road. Um, 
I, I think Scott has done a great design. I think there are really terrific improvements here, and I'm glad to see the, the pencil sharpening. I think there's more pencil sharpening in order, um, and I will get to that at another time. But I have a bunch of questions here I would like to pose to you, and I'll follow up with an email outlining exactly what I've said so you don't have to deal with it otherwise, and but so the public can also hear it. Um, I wonder how much construction will be done during the school year and how much interruption there will be for the students. Uh, I wonder about the value of doing all the projects at once. I wonder whether you can actually do that. That seems like a whole lot to deal with at once. And I wonder whether you forego the possibility of catching errors before they occur again in a second situation, in a second project. I. I <laughs> I have to question, you know, I think it's very good that you've cut down the amount that everybody has to pay per year, but I still think that, you know, when you go into the grocery store and you have to spend $100, $125 instead of $99, it makes a big difference. So if you could get it down under 100 that would be really nice. It would be more helpful and more saleable. Um, the, Betsy brought up the question of, of two uh, questions on the referendum last time. I, I wonder, could you have two, uh, oh, uh, there was some argument about how you couldn't have two bonds, I, and, and it was said that, the, that it would be difficult to pass two bonds, but again, one of the suggestions that, that Prakash Nair made in his book was that if you prove that the first project works, then you can go and, and people will want to give you money for a second project. So I, I think that you might consider asking two questions, one being, we do this project first, and then if, and, and so if the first question has to be answered positively on the referendum, then the second question would be, okay, so if we do that first and it costs this much, will you approve us uh, spending a, an additional amount to complete a second project? So like the high school and then the five, six or vice versa. <coughs> and finally, there is this trust issue. I, I can't believe that Anybody doesn't question the, the idea of giving 130 authorization for 129 million, which is actually 130 million, and then expecting nobody to spend it. It's just like, you know, it's really hard, hard given the fact that there's not a 100% trust issue with, with the expenditures that the school board has made in the past. They haven't all worked out, and the promises that have been made have not always worked out, whether they were for money or for other, other situations. So thank you for all your work, and I appreciate the openness here. Um, I, I find it's more effective to communicate with you directly, and I appreciate this, the fe feedback that you've given. Thank you, Mayor. So just on deck is uh, Andrea Spala. Hi, Dina Shaw. I live at 185 Clover Lane. Um, having been involved with the schools for a number of years and having seen the rising enrollment and the effect at all of the schools, I hope you vote in favor of this tonight. Um, when we first started seeing this big rising enrollment in 2016, you know, we all looked around for how we were going to fix things, but we can't kick the can down the road anymore. It's time for all of us, even the residents, I don't really have an interest in paying a, as a, a rise in all the taxes that I will have to pay, but we have to do it as a community. We have an issue in the fourth grade and below that is enormous. John Witherspoon, I think the community should go visit the middle school and the high school if they haven't, because they need to see how brimming the halls are at that at PHS and the kids bumping into each other. And yes, there is no place for the kids to eat there. And at John Witherspoon, we had almost 800 kids last year. We're down a little bit this year. But in two years, we could be well over that figure. And there's, it's, it's unsafe. And you put in there that the high school's maximum capacity is 1423. I don't know if the community knows, but we're over 1600, right, or close to it. So we, it, we have to now. And, and it always comes a time in, in a community where you have to own this kind of expense. And I think this is where we are. And we have more housing coming. That's not something we can do much about. I think that the town fought that. Um, and now we have to own it. So I hope you vote for this tonight. And looking at all those costs in that timeline, I think it's reasonable. It took me two and a half years to build a house. Um, these are huge things and very, very necessary. And I have two seventh graders who will live through the entire construction at PHS. So. Um, I'm still in favor of it, so thank you. And thank you all for all you do for our community because I know it is, uh, it's wonderful what you do and it's thankless, but it's wonderful. So thank you. Thank you, Jane. 
Uh, up next is Kevin Royer on deck. I mean, is Kevin Royer? Uh, hi. I'm going to give you all a little bit of a history lesson because I know how much you love me lecturing you about what's gone on in the past. I'll try to make it really short. Um, so we are always, the theme of my lecture is, we are always about 20 years behind where we need to be in our facilities. And that is because of the respectfulness of this school board and past school boards of, to taxpayer sensitivities. And I think that's great. But at the end of the day, your first priority, our first priority as a community needs to be ensuring the continuing excellence of our public schools, and that means creating and funding the space that they need to, to thrive. So um, in 2001, that some people referred to, that referendum was long overdue. Yes, there were some problems with the construction. Um, that does happen. It's New Jersey. Um, but <laughs> but um, at that time, that, that doubled the footprint of the high school and the middle school, and that high school hadn't been touched since the 60s. So it was all, and by the time that construction was done, it was almost time for more. And in 2011, we did do a second referendum for the things that couldn't get squeezed into the 2001 referendum, I think mostly for political reasons. There was a sort of sensitivity about the cost. Um, and that passed, and it was fine, it went fine, um, but it's not optimal. And even that 2011 referendum was kind of just playing catch up again. So I urge you, I think this is beyond urgent, it's emergent, and um, sorry, I don't know why I'm so nervous. <laughs> I think I'm just um, a little bit keyed up about uh, my concern that there's a, a sense that this is not something that the public supports. And I just want to assure you that I've talked to a lot of people in town, I know you guys do too, probably way more than I do, but um, my sense is that the public understands the need for this. They want the schools to continue to be great. They want to do what's right for the kids. They just want to make sure that it's being done through the right process and all that stuff. And so, and I think you guys are doing a good job. So keep that up. I would just urge you, one um, set of concerns that I heard over and over again was from people who are staunch public school supporters is, I, I will vote yes for this referendum, but I'm so afraid that Steve and everybody else is gonna drop the ball on all the other really important things that we've been working so hard to achieve, right? Wellness, homework, um, restorative justice, right? These are so important. We can't lose sight of them. So please, in your messaging about the, <coughs> sorry, referendum, tie the need for the referendum and your support of it and the space designs to those strategic goal needs because um, programmatic uh, needs should drive the space. Okay, sorry, thanks. thanks. Thank you. Okay, Kevin, and just on, on deck is uh, Daniel Dart. Hi, I'm Kevin Royer, uh, 21 Maple Street. Um, I'm here as uh, the parent of two children who have gone through the school system, uh, and as somebody who moved to this community uh, because it was a community that valued excellence in schools, having been raised in a community that didn't. Um, I wanted to make very clear to you uh, the importance from my perspective as somebody whose children will not benefit from any of the things that are on the table today. That I clearly support this action as a member of this community, having benefited from decisions of other members of the community in the past that benefited my children. Um, I think it's important for you to know that there are, I think, many people like me in the community who aren't necessarily actively voicing their support of continued excellence in the, in the public school system. We're out there, we have your backs. Uh, we recognize the importance of this. I urge you to continue on your path. It strikes me as a remarkably coherent and well-engineered program. Um, I would discourage you from taking pieces off of it because from what I can tell, it hangs together as a piece and to take the, the five, six school off will actually not allow the rest of the, the coherent piece to work together. So I'll give back the rest of the time. Just wanted to say you guys are doing Yeoman's work. Thank you for all you do, uh, and you have my support. Thank you, Thank you Kevin. Hey, hey, Mr. Mr. Darden, just, that just one. Uh, so, and on deck is uh, Charlotte O'Connell. Thank you. So, my name is Daniel Dart. I spoke before. I'm a parent of a graduate from uh, the Princeton school system. She's a freshman in college, started the first grade, went through uh, JW, and uh, in the high school had a great experience. Went on to a nice college. 
And I'm the parent of a fourth grader at uh, Johnson Park, and we live on Wendover Drive in, in Princeton. Let me just say that uh, I think for $50 million, as opposed to $130 million, you could do a lot. I mean, $130 million is a ton of money, and you don't get one new teacher for $130 million. The interest cost is $5.5 million. You don't get one new teacher. You're spending $5.5 million a year. It's a ton of money. And so what, what happens is, number one, you're going to run a huge risk that the referendum isn't, isn't approved at $130 million, you know, at that level. It's a huge number. And so you're going to do all this work, spend all this time, hire all these people, and run a huge risk on October 2nd that $130 million is not approved. $50 million is a responsible number. I looked at your past bond issuance and other things, and $50 million would cure a lot of asbestos. Uh, at, uh, at Princeton High School. Yeah, but we wouldn't be able to put the walls back. For <laughs> anyway, 50 million buys you a lot. Um, number two is the, the, you know, facilities in the end are a luxury. They're not a necessity. I played golf with a five with two kids at uh, Community Park who said my kids could be educated in a warm barn with great teachers and small classroom sizes. So facilities don't make, there's no study in the universe that I've seen saying luxur luxurious facilities uh, contribute to great education. The fact is that we've had great education here with uh, social facilities. The second thing is that this will put enormous pressure on the operating budget. You have two budgets. This is the capital budget. Yeah, I got 53 seconds. Yes. You just. You just took, reset the clock, please. <laughs> <laughs> but this is going to put enormous pressure on the operating budget. And you'll probably be back with a tax increase because of the need to hire teachers. Because newer facilities, new facilities, a new 5 6 school, renovated facilities, guess what they're going to have? Higher operating costs. And so you'll be back with a tax increase to support the operating budget. So when I talk to people and say we're going to spend $130 million, a community the size of Princeton, spend $5.5 million a year in annual interest, and we're not getting one new teacher, they're like, what's going on? So I think you really need to think about that, the risk that it doesn't get approved, the, the operating budget versus the capital budget, and what you could do for 50 million versus 130 million. There's a looming pension crisis in the state. I went through the annual report today, and there's a $40 million de deficit in one of the pension plans. So, this isn't the only issue facing the Princeton School District. And uh, so, uh, when you talk about the tax impact, and people see a referendum with low numbers, and you don't include what's going on in the operating budget. You don't include what's going on in the police and fire in the other parts of the city. You don't include what's going on in the state. You don't include what's going on in the uh, federal level where taxes, state and local taxes, are no longer deductible except for $10,000. The cumulative burden is enormous. And what you may see is the mix of prison, Princeton residents change. So you have wealthy residents could move out, move to Florida, not pay any taxes. And you could have people who have their kids in private school move out. And those people don't cost uh, any, have any burden on the school system. So if you change the mix of the, re of the residents, it's going to have a huge impact on the schools. Anyway, thank you. OK, thank you. Uh, there is no other list. Oh, there's no. no. So uh, uh, next, Charlotte O'Connell, and then uh, last and on deck is uh, John Chen. Thanks, I'm Charlotte O'Connell, 116 Patton Avenue. Um, two things real quick. Will the next week about Cranberry be a forum? I know we're not supposed to be questioning you guys, and, and I just want to know when we get to talk about stuff. No, it, it will be a regular meeting with presentations, public comments, et cetera. Okay. So it will won't there be, a, be forum. a forum about Cranberry and continuing that? Well, there December will be a, a, a month before we vote, so there will, in fact, be two meetings where you'll have 
public comment about those issues, but I think it, that's for the next meeting. So. Okay, so we should be trying to get more and more in contact with the board members uh, on that personally. Uh, are the reporters here? I'm hoping that the reporters will report what the comments are here too because um, the last couple papers I've been not been able to make meetings and all we get are what the board has to say. So I'm hoping that we get some of the public comments into the reporters in the newspapers too. Okay. Um, Somebody already commented about what I was saying was, what if it fails? Uh, that was one of the issues. What will we do if this thing fails in the fall? Um, are, are the projections to 2017 including the development that's potential in Cranberry? Because Cranberry has 40 acres of undeveloped, developable land. And we know Princeton doesn't have that much acreage that's developable. But there will be more, you know, we're just projecting the numbers that we can see here in Princeton. Are we projecting those numbers into Cranberry too? Like they've got 280 now, are they going to be 400 in the next 10 years? In the projecting the numbers, you know, you, that demographic study that you did. We did include, or uh, consult with Cranberry in doing the demographic study, yes. And I don't, so those numbers, no, okay. So, um, so I'll let that one go until the Cranberry thing. Cranberry's numbers are actually going down. Right, but they have developable land, so that's a different thing for next week. The comments about athletics, I'm also an athlete. I've got 58 seconds, I'll go. I'm also an athlete. I completely think that that's a great thing to have great athletics, but the 2002 issue that came up and has always been a craw in my side is that pool is owned by the school system, and it should have been a community pool, and so should that auditorium have been an, a community situation. So to make turf fields is a great idea, but they have absolutely they have to be open to the public. And the problem is, if the kids are there, we can't be there because it's not secure, which is one of our issues now. So turf fields, you might want to talk to the town and say, hey, put that in the town's budget, put them over where the kids' soccer fields are so everybody can use them and I get, I'm not locked out for the whole school day. I mean, it's important. I am a big athletes person, but if you take another facility that needs to be Sorry, I don't mean to be angry about it. That needs to be for the whole town. We're not going to be happy about that. It's, it needs to happen again. Thank you. Okay, and last is uh, Jian Chen. Uh, my name is Jian Chen. I'm from uh, Edo Farm. Uh, sorry about early. Uh, this is my first trip to the BOE meeting, so don't know the rule very well. <laughs> I'll learn. I'll learn. Uh, also, English is not my first uh, language, so uh, I hope you guys cut me some slack on the timing. <laughs> Mm, first, I'd like to thank the board uh, for all the work that you have done so far, and uh, particularly the courage to take on a such uh, project of this size and the level of complexity. Uh, but I think what we're looking at here is a really a project of a frighteningly large size. The proposed bond offering uh, and the interest payment put together will put the spending to well over $200 million. So that amounts to about two years of the school's operating budget. I think for any organization to take on the risk of that size, it is significant. So proportionally, proportionally, it will be the equivalent of Walmart taking on a $1 trillion investment program. Let that sink in. So, so I think I'm pretty sure that uh, I'm glad that the board is not taking a trust us, let us do our job approach. But I do encourage, because in the private sector, if someone takes on, if Walmart takes on a, such a big project, they will go all the way, they will go all, go all the way to gather all this, uh, as much stakes, uh, shareholder support as possible and clearly explaining to them the rationale and the necessity of that project. And I think Princeton is blessed with residents who are accomplished professionals in their fields, in school planning, in project management, in construction. I urge the board to go out and seek their input. So as a shareholder, right, if you don't like what management we're talking about. If you don't like Walmart's plan, 
it costs you $4.99 to dump your Walmart stock. But as residents, we don't have that luxury. What I want to say is this, the impact of this referendum will be felt long after the terms of your board membership expires. As residents, we don't want to see oops, and we can't afford it. Now, take this into consideration. What if that Walmart management team collectively has zero year of experience in actually seeing through that $1 trillion investment project, let alone producing desired results. Now some experts, some really, really smart people once said, if all you have is a hammer, every problem you see looks like a nail. I would like to ask the board of members to ask themselves whether your taxing authority is the only tool in your toolbox. Thank you, Mr. Chen. So your time's up. I, you went over three minutes. Thank you. Can I still speak? I came in late. I didn't get to sign in. Uh, sh I, I guess we really have to take really time to, to vote, and we've, we've still got a meeting ahead of us. But um, uh, I just want to say I don't think you're ready. I don't think you have the detailed cost estimate you should have. I don't think you have the detailed schedule. I have yet to see the building program. I've asked for it repeatedly. I've not seen a circulation plan for the high school. I'm just concerned that we're headed down the same road as the addition to the high school. We are just not prepared yet. And I think that's why that addition went bad. Uh, so I just want to bring that to your attention. I know you're working really hard at this, and I know you're all new at doing this. So you really are kind of a little bit up, up uh, Pa river without a paddle. We've talked about um, commissioning agent, we've talked about construction manager, very good ideas, but they're not aboard at this point and we need to have cost, est uh, cost estimates and we need to have cuts. So I just want to leave that in your head. Thank you very much. Thank you. And sir, if, if you were late and you didn't get a chance to sign up, you can have Charles Kreider's time. So if, you. if you'd like to. The back, I would have had to the yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, and just uh, you know, two minutes, please, if you can. Uh, I'll be very quick. Thank My you. name is Patrick Simon. I live at 17 Harriet Drive. Um, just a, a few quick points. The first one is thank you very much for all of the hard work y each of you have done uh, in, in working on this, um, both in terms of trying to meet the needs and in terms of trying to sharpen the pencils. Uh, having said that, I have to share two pieces of bad news. One is I can't make the numbers on the last slide tie out. I think it's Brian. Um, the uh, the per hundred thousand dollar number, if you multiply it out, it doesn't add up over 30 years to the amount for the debt service. I, I think maybe you're stretching out over more than 30 years. I'm not sure. But if you're doing that, then you should be aware that for most of that time, it's a higher number. Uh, the, the second thing that I think the board should be very aware of is every single bond issue in the last 10 years in the state of New Jersey, over $85 million has failed. And it didn't matter whether it was a single number or split apart into pieces. If it was on a single referendum vote, it failed. Uh, it's just something you should be aware of. Th th this town has a history of supporting the schools. I think you're going to test it sorely if you go with a, a bond referendum this large. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So we appreciate everyone coming out tonight. We appreciate all your comments. We also appreciate the disciplined way in which we had the public comments tonight. Um, and again, it was a, I think it's been a great discussion of, of all the things that we've been working on for quite a while. Um, and so with that, I think we move to item D, which is the, um, the, the projects themselves. And again, we've had, we've had a lot of discussion. Is there any other, first we need a motion for, is it still called item D? It's now item E, but I think we had a motion to open that, uh, Greg, and a second, Daphna. Do you need time for that, Stephanie? Okay, um, so if there's any other questions or comments before we, we talk about this, um, and we're gonna do D1 and D2 together, 
we divided it up just for clarity's sake that there's sort of two parts to this um, to this motion. The first being um, sort of everything but the high school re uh, renovations, which is D, uh, now E1, and then E2 being the high school. Um, is, this a, is this a roll call vote? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. We have comment time now, right? You have, but there's uh, open for comments. If I mean, again, we've had time for questions, comments. But if anyone wants to make any additional well, comments, now is the time to do so. About the athletics, that people have raised questions about that. I, you know, athletics and APs are both, I don't know, important, almost equally important in my mind. Probably a few years ago, I wouldn't have said that. But seeing how much it's been good for my kids and kids that are competing on teams, um, you know, I think maybe. Athletics are maybe even more important than uh, APs at this point because you know, we worry about their wellness. And then if they're at the high school or the middle school, they're part of a team. They have this camaraderie. It's probably what they're going to look back on and remember the most from their high school career. If they have a tough day, um, they'll hang out with their teammates and they'll talk about it. Um, you know, I, my kids do the running, so they run together and they you know, commiserate about their terrible lives together, I'm sure, as they're running and sweating it. So to me, it would be very hard to knock off the athletics because I feel like it's going to do a lot more than allow a kid to hit a ball or run in a circle or throw a ball. It, uh, it's all part of the wellness. And I think Andrea Spala was asking that we tie some of this to the district goals. And I think the athletics are one of the, the, the best things we can do for that. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Any other, any other comments or questions on this, Greg? Yeah, thanks, uh, Pat. I wanted to sort of just highlight something that you've been saying to us for the last 10, 12 months now on this journey. And it's something that, that Andrea Spala also said. And I just wanted to say that this, com and, and, and other people have as well, this is a community that values public education. We're in it together. We always have been. We benefited from the decisions that were made in the past. There is a reason why we have municipal finance. The municipal finance allows communities to get together and to pay for large projects over a long period of time, knowing that those projects are going to last for decades. Our original school has. And so that is the, the decision we're making now. Um, I want to commend the board here. And I also wanted to point out something else, that this decision process has been a long process. It'll continue to be a long process. That's right. That's the, what we should be doing as a community. We need your input. We're not asking for, you know, for we don't need you to ask us. We need you to continue to bring your ideas to work with us together. This is not the end of the process. This is a continuation of the process. But I also wanted to sort of just emphasize one other thing. This is a process where we've been joined by experts from many different fields. Uh, first of all, we have the vision of our superintendent. Second of all, we have the financial acumen of our business administrator. Third of all, we're building on the shoulders of people who came before us. We have the topmost rating for bond rating that allows us to do something like this. We've got the resources and we've got the people in the community who can help. And we need your help and we want your help and we welcome your help. We also have, have the help of our architects, our bond council. We have the help of so many other people. And I think the community should feel good about the deliberate nature of what we are doing. And um, we also, among the board members themselves, have, some, has, have someone who actually shepherded a beautiful municipal town hall um, through to completion. We have others of us who have real estate experience and signed basically hundreds of millions of dollars of mortgage notes in, in their career. We have other people who bring other skills. And plus, we have the people who know education. All that comes together. We don't have all the answers. That's why we're reaching out. But I am very, very excited about being here today to discuss this, to listen to the community, and to pledge to the community that we'll continue to be working together with you through this long process. We don't know what's going to happen on October 2nd. The community decides then. You may vote yes, you may vote no. We can't tell you how to vote. We can tell you to vote. And um, I'm looking forward to this. And I'm, I'm very happy 
that I have a chance here to be working with my fellow colleagues on something that's this important for our students and our teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Anyone else before we vote? I would like Michelle? to Go ahead. say something. Um, and, and I'm going to start by, by saying that I really wanted to vote for this tonight. I really did. Um, and about 20 years ago, I was in this same position, um, looking at a plan um, that was going to cost the community a lot of money and just knowing that it was not fully fleshed out, that it was not right for the town. And so what we had to do was say... You know what? We're going to put the pause, we're going to hit the pause button and we're going to look at this more closely. And and I think that my clarity at this point is even more so because this is a school district that has a strategic plan that's focused on wellness and every child known and closing the achievement gap, innovation and experimentation, care, connectiveness and communication. We should have been leading with those strategic priorities in planning this project and developing this project. We did not. And I, because we did not, um, I think there's a lot of unknowns in this plan. And so that's the discomfort that you're feeling. It's not, it is the $129 million. It is. Um, but it's obligating. And I think that Scott's been pretty clear. If we approve this tonight, we are obligating ourselves to a $129 million plan. Now, we don't have to spend $129 million, but if I leave here after three years, if, if there's a whole different group of people who are sitting up here, they still have the authority to spend that money. Um, I've been persuaded that we need a 5-6 school um, to alleviate projected overcrowding. And I think that security upgrades at the elementary schools are needed. My concern is with the cost, um, with the absence of programmatic connection to our strategic pr priorities, and I'm going to keep going back to that because that's what we say we're about. That's what we keep talking about. We've got to be about it. And um, the need to relocate the public school administration and where we're going to park the buses. So, so while the school is a great idea, the associated costs of that are still in flux. And there's a lot of details around this plan that are still in flux. Some people are comfortable with that level of uncertainty. When the price tag is $129 million, I need to be a little bit more confident about what we're doing and how we're spending our money. So while I think these things need to be done and I'm just like I'm the only one up here who's built a public building. I'm probably the only one who, adult who spent a full day at Princeton High School, and yeah, it's crowded and, and can be not very much fun. But I think that we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to you to take the time to thoughtfully and carefully plan this expansion plan so we can have a right sized and right priced project for our children and for our taxpayers. And this is not to disparage anybody who's worked on this because folks have worked super hard on trying to come up with this plan. And our professionals, and it, they've just done amazing work, my colleagues, but we are an excellent town and our kids deserve an excellent choice and our taxpayers deserve to have the best when they pay their hard earned dollars for this project. And the current state that it's in now, I can't support it. Thank you. So I just would like to address um, uh, your concerns that it hasn't been fully fleshed out. And so I was put on the facilities committee by uh, Ms. Spala, and uh, this is the last place I want to be because uh, this is not why I joined the school board. I joined it to move kids ahead, but it's an important role. So I've been on the facilities committee for three years. Uh, the last two I've chaired it. Um, I've worked very close. Um, the process has been, I think, um, very transparent. We um, worked very hard to make sure that we had two experienced um, architects that have extensive experience with schools. We have that with Scott and um, the fellows at um, Fielding there. We um, went 
out of our way to not only hear from our um, constituents about a variety of things, but we also took their feedback into account. We spoke with um, constituents about historic preservation. We spoke about athletics. We spoke about sustainability. Uh, we spoke. We even had one meeting about cost. We have taken every um, feedback that we could and and used it. And so when, as you, and you see in the plans tonight, a lot of that has been incorporated. Um, so the one thing that I hear from the dissenters or the people who are not going to support this vote is the cost. But I don't hear what we're go what our choice is. I don't know what we're supposed to do with the kids. And so I'm supporting this plan. Um, I'm confident that our professionals will execute. Um, I'm supporting this plan because I believe this is the right plan for kids. Now, whether or not Princeton values public education, we'll see on October 2nd. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like the plan is is where it should be at this point. I mean, I don't want final architecture plans now. I don't want, I mean, I don't like the number. I wish the number was a lot lower. Um, I wish it was more palatable. But this is where it's supposed to be right now in the development. Um, you know, we initially had this addition, this box that was on the side of the high school that was functional, but it had all sorts of other problems. Um, I had some problems initially with this new design um, in the cost, but everything about it is wonderful. It's uh, a great use of space. It's, um, it seems like it's cutting edge teaching. Walking around some universities, I see like my old chemistry building from the, the 20s. I wasn't there in the 20s, but um, <laughs> they've updated and it looks a lot like what we're talking about doing in the atrium and it looks stunning. Um, it just, I feel like we're, we're where we should be. I wish we could get the cost down, but we will be getting the cost down between now and J July, or whenever we have the next vote. We don't know how much it'll be, but that's to me when the, the most important vote is gonna be, because then we'll spend a lot of time listening to people, working on the numbers and figuring out what we're gonna include. So, yeah, I feel like we're ready to go to the next phase. So for me, it's, it's an easy yes. Probably the harder vote is in July. but. I don't know what the other alternative is with crowded schools. Thanks, Bill. Pat, this, um, I've been a school board member for 10 years. I've been on facilities for, I think, nine of those 10 years and chaired facilities for about six of that. Um, this board is faced with trying to solve several problems with this referendum. Uh, the state of New Jersey demands that schools have a 2% cap. With a 2% cap, you cannot fix problems that you are recovering in this referendum. So you have two, you have two things that you're doing in this referendum, and you cannot help either one. You have an enrollment crisis. It's not going to go away. Yes, Cranberry is part of that enrollment. We are part of your district. Uh, so I'll, I'll take any heat for that. But you have an enrollment crisis. You also have HVAC that has to be done. You have fields that are rotting. You have a facility and, and a, a large district that needs security upgrades. You have entrances that need to be secured. That is brick and mortar issue that has to be addressed and that is not cheap. So you are addressing a mirage of things, but if you're gonna go in and start moving things around, you might as well do it all at once because there's cost savings to be had there. If you do renovation instead of new construction, you can save money. If you do this thoughtfully, you can save money. If you do it all at one time, you can save money. But ladies and gentlemen, you have an enrollment crisis. That's what this is all about. And if you're gonna do it and you're gonna move walls, you might as well fix the HVAC. And if you're gonna move walls and you're gonna have asbestos abatement, well, while you're in there, you might as well do the other things that need to be done. So 
while some people may not value my opinion because I am only a representative from Cranberry on this board, I will tell you in my 10 years experience as a facilities committee chairman, this is, this is not something that anyone around this board I would think is frothing to do, but I think it is the responsible thing to do. And, and quite frankly, I think it would be irresponsible to do anything less. The high school halls are crowded. And the cell and bell, as it was noted, designed by the school, quite frankly, is against the security designs that are going on right now. So our, if, if, if there's anything that our student representatives have taught us is to not sit back on our loins and design ourselves to nauseam, it is to react. They have asked us to react, we are doing that. They have said we need and we are trying to be responsive to the students. As Daphna said, she doesn't want to be chair, but she's doing it. She's doing an excellent job. But she's doing it with children at the forefront. And she's thanking Andrea every day, I am sure. But she puts children at the forefront. So for the taxpayers, this is painful, and I agree with that. Mr. Massachusetts, I could not agree with you more. I think this number is a hard number to swallow. But I think it's hard to swallow because the district is having to do so much because as Andrea said, you're having to play catch up. And I'm sorry that you have to play catch up, but if you're gonna play catch up, do it right. And I think this is done right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hey, can I, can I comment again? Sorry. Hey, can I comment again? Sure, All go right, ahead, so, um, I myself do not like spending money. That's just kind of one thing about me. You won't um, have to. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I know, but this is going somewhere. So uh, that, that, that number does look very painful to comprehend, and I don't think I'm quite there yet, but whenever I would go out to buy something with my mom, my mom would always have a, I guess, like not exactly a saying, but like uh, something that she would always draw into my head. And is that if you want to buy something and you want to skimp on the cost of lower quality, sure, that'll save you a bit in the short run, but eventually you're going to have to replace that. And if you're paying for something that's cheaper, you might have to replace it sooner than later. And in the end, you'll be spending more money, like, as you'll be spending more net money in the end. So I think that kind of, I think that's kind of rings true here because, I mean, my personal opinion is that the schools are not terribly crowded, but I think from our student survey data of 500 responses, if you... If you kind of can see it over here, this is the graphs about how crowded our students think individual areas of our school are. And you can tell that overwhelmingly that they're pretty high to say the least. If I sent you guys this data, I don't know if you can just for reference here. So I think that although I, my personal opinion is that it isn't too terrible, I think it's that a lot of student opinions have shown that it is pretty terrible. And even if we just go with my conservative estimate as to how crowded the schools are, sooner or later we will have to spend on this. So... I don't see any harm in spending now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. If, if there's no further comments, maybe we go to a vote. Uh, very great. very okay, brief. Go ahead. I just wanted to uh, to thank Evelyn for her, her guidance, uh, as she has done over and over again. Uh, I value your, your, your wisdom. I value your experience. I also value the experience of, of former board uh, uh, people here uh, who are, are helping all of us work together. Um, and I also just wanted to say that I value the, the input from the students and the teachers as well. Uh, and it's, we're all in this together. This is an important vote. And I just wanted to, again, say thank you to, to all my colleagues. And I also just wanted to highlight something that, that uh, Superintendent Cochran sent around the other day, which is uh, research that shows that facilities do impact the quality of our education and the achievement of our students. That when you learn in classrooms that are hot, when you learn in classrooms where, where panels from the ceiling are falling down, when you learn in classrooms where the windows have to be nailed shut, even when the temperature is 91 degrees, you will not learn as well or as efficiently. If we were in the private sector, most of us would not stand for that type of conditions. 
We've stood for it for a long time. We can always try to stand for it for more. Those are OSHA violations. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And this is our opportunity now to, to stand up uh, for, as, as this community always has. And, and so this is what we're, uh, plus the security issues, which we're behind the times. And we need to face that face on as a community as well. So um, thank you again to all the board members. Thanks, Greg. All right. So we split this into two parts, D1 and D2. So we're going to, uh, we don't, we do already had a motion, so we're good for, um, sorry, E1. You're the one. <laughs> yeah. There's always one. Yeah. 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 Um, How are you voting, Bill? Yes. <laughs> Got it. I was hoping to go computerless. Aren't you an engineer? <laughs> no, no They're always the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Engineer. The motion passes. And E now for E2. Oh, we need a first and a second. Uh, uh, Beth and a second, uh, Debbie. Cast your votes. motion carries so, so I'd just like to say congratulations to this board like many of the speakers tonight I'm a product of public schools I think many of us are um, in particular I went to a school where the community really valued education unlike the one speaker tonight um, you know and that really stuck with me it was a place that 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 was number one and it it was important then it's important now um, like a lot of the speakers I moved here because of the schools and I saw what the people before us had built. It was wonderful. Um, I think we do owe it to ourselves, and we owe it to you to maintain the excellence of this school system, and we did that tonight. So thank you. Okay, and with that, uh, can we have a, refer a, a motion, motion to adjourn? <laughs> Not a referendum to adjourn. That's in October. <laughs> and Debbie. Okay, all in favor. <laughs>